the only announcement for tonight. And so with that, Alicia, could you please call the roll? Yes, sir. And good evening, everyone. Councilmember Brockett. Present. Friend. Here. Joseph is absent. Nagel. Here. Swetlick. Here. Wallach. Present. Weaver. Here. Yates. Present. And Young. Present. Mayor, we have our quorum. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing we need to do tonight is to amend the agenda. Um, we are tonight going to remove item 4B, which is a call up consideration for 2504 Spruce Street. We have moved that item to the September 28th meeting when we will have a full council compliment. So could I please have a motion to amend the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Great, we have a motion and a second. Does anyone object to amending the agenda? Great, seeing no objections, we'll remove item 4B. And with that, we will move on to open comment. And before we go there, Ryan, I believe that you are going to go over the public participation guidelines. Sure thing, let me pull those up. Those are coming up here. <clears throat> Have a little trouble opening. Let's make sure it's open all the way first. Okay, here we go. Thank you for your patience. You bet. It looks like it's coming up on my end. Is that coming up on your end? I do not yet see anything, but that you have started screen sharing. There we go. I see slides. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we are glad that you're here and are eager to hear uh, your voice. And we want to make sure that we're finding a balance between meaningful and transparent engagement in online security. So, so, please. so Ryan, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, but your slide is cut off. We can't see the words on it. So maybe if you just go back to the non, there you go. You can just leave it like that and go through it. Sure thing. Um, want to make sure that everyone is aware that this meeting is called to conduct the business of the city uh, folder uh, only and any activities that disrupt that business are, are not allowed. Uh, the time for question for speaking, uh, asking questions is limited and we'll make sure to move through our participants and open comment when we get there. And open comment participants will share uh, with their full name. And um, we'll hear from our open comment participants uh, audio only. Uh, and you know, the, the person presiding at this meeting, in this case, Mayor Weaver, uh, will work to enforce these rules uh, as needed. And just to note that the chat functionality <clears throat> has been disabled, um, please send any technical or process questions in the Q&A feature. And that's all, and I'll turn it back to you. Super, thank you very much, Ryan. And with that, we are ready to go to open comment. As always with open comment, each speaker will have two minutes. Tonight, we have seven speakers signed up, and our first three are Patrick Murphy, Lynn Siegel, and Ashlyn Manning. Patrick, you have two minutes. My name is Patrick Murphy. I've lived in Boulder for 52 years. 
the Muni mercifully died on November 2020, Boulder had a chance to demonstrate what fast and responsive means with respect to climate change and engaging Boulder citizens in what some of you have correctly defined as an existential threat, climate change. Boulder is failing both the speed and quality tests. For example, the Excel Energy Partnership Advisory Panel took six months to establish and is made up of 18 Boulder citizens. It has been an additional three months and no public meeting has occurred. In short, Boulder is not quick and responsive, but rather slow and sluggish as the embarrassment of the lost 10 years and $30 million of the Muni failure and the 80% water rate increase due to a poorly maintained and run water utility demonstrate. In addition, in a totally illogical fashion, Boulder collects about $7 million a year in carbon taxes. I repeat, carbon taxes. The other 3 million are producing very little in comparison to what they could be. Give us back that $4 million of carbon taxes and pay for police and fire with a separate tax. The carbon action leadership are leftovers from the Muni effort and have lost the ability to act versus proselytize endlessly. We need action not actors with vapor goals. All things are complex and nothing is simple, but the simplest ways to accelerate engaging Boulder citizens in carbon reduction are solar incentives, wind incentives, a renewable energy certificate broker, and energy use reduction. Engage us all by giving out free LEDs to all citizens, starting with the low and middle income groups. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> Next, we have Lynn Siegel, Ashlyn Manning, and Riley Mancuso. Lynn? Some emergency, this annexation. I hope they sue you. The 42-inch interceptor, our sewer line, that seven years ago, Redline Robotics said it was in danger of collapse. The 42-inch interceptor is an emergency. The other 15 drainages in Boulder that aren't attended to are an emergency. It's an emergency that another 100-year event is prepared for, not accounting that there was a 1,000-year rain simultaneous to the 100-year event of 2013. It's like Biden today deporting the Haitians and denying the argument that it's a matter of public health in a pandemic. Talk about climate change refugees, two of them for Haiti, and now the creation of more development in Boulder to subject more inhabitants to be subjected to climate change events so they can be transformed to refugees. Asylum is stopped before you create the need for asylum in Boulder. Now, there was a very great letter written today. The current agreement will not achieve long-term flood protection for Fraser Meadows. It may fail to even achieve adequate flood protection at all. This is due to a provision of the agreement that blocks the future authority of the city of Boulder over the property. Once signed, the city will have no power to block or alter any aspect of CU's future development plans. The current agreement is writ as written will be the final moment of the city's power to enact critical solutions on the CU South site for centuries. Successful flood mitigation depends on exactly what is built on the CU South site throughout its development and redevelopment in the future. This depends upon ongoing city authority over building decisions on CU South informed by future information about site plan, climate impacts, and other situations. Continued equal partnership and solving, solution, solving issues in decades to come will be absolutely critical. Climate change will move the goalposts from 100 to 500 year flood standards. Thank It'll you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Your time is up. <clears throat> Next, we have Ashlyn Manning, Riley Mancuso, and Kevin Tang. And Riley Mancuso, if you are here, we don't see you in the meeting. So if you could go into the Q&A and let us know you're here, that'd be great. Um, with that, we will go to Ashlyn Manning. Ashley, you should be able to mute yourself, unmute yourself. Can We're you hear me now? Feedback. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. I own a condo in the Gold Run community on Boulder Creek near Scott Carpenter Park. 
And year round, we have an issue with waste artifacts of substance abuse and other discarded items in and around the creek. And this is much worse in the summertime when there are individuals camping on the banks of the creek, as I'm sure you know, many of them leaving strewn clothing and kitchen scraps, among other unsanitary items in and around the water. In recent weeks, I found dinner plates and something that looked like a toilet seat from across the bank. The water of the creek is of spiritual significance to me and experiencing it as a healing is a healing ritual for me. On August 22nd this summer in a place where I often enjoy bathing in the water, I found a rusty grate under the water threatening to cut my bare feet and soiling my experience of being with the water. Um, I then took that with me among many other things um, and could not find a place to discard it um, as there were no waste receptacles anywhere nearby. Um, so I wonder if the issue of waste in the water might be slightly ameliorated by having permanent trash receptacles more readily available. I'm often collecting trash with me and carrying it back to the Gold Run private trash bins because between 30th Street and 28th Street and beyond that, there are no obvious waste bins to be found on the creek trail. Um, I myself have led small group trash cleanup efforts twice and I've always carted away um, you know, big bags of trash and I realize I'm running out of time. So I noticed that there was a let's tidy up boulder challenge posted on the website, which I would not have known about um, on my own. And while that's a well intentioned effort, it is underwhelming as a solution to our waste problem. I think that the lack of recycling and trash bins in obvious sight is making it difficult for any citizens and certainly those who are creating this waste to be incentivized to help clean it up. Thank you. Thank you, Ashlyn. Um, I know that your time is up, but if you'd like to email us your the rest of your comments, you can email it at council at bouldercolorado.gov. And with that, the next three speakers are Riley Mancuso, Kevin Tang, and Kathy Joyner. Ryan, has Riley Mancuso shown up? Okay, in that case, we will go on to Kevin Tang. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to address this council. Um, earlier this calendar year, the council approved a number of initiatives ostensibly aimed at ameliorating issues stemming from homelessness, housing insecurity and consequences from the camping ban. Uh, my intent here is not to focus on whether or not these initiatives should have been adopted. They already have been adopted at an approximate price tag of $2.7 million over 18 months. Uh, rather, my goal is to ask for continuing transparency into and oversight of those programs. Speaking as a recent Denver transplant, I feel it's very vital that those initiatives, which I understand include, among other things, expanded internal cleanup resources, a uh, contracted ambassador program and urban ranger program, among others, uh, do not all ultimately devolve into variations on the same themes of enhanced policing and criminalization of mere existence. On the oversight front, um, to the extent outside service providers are used, I think the public has an interest in knowing, for example, uh, what kind of sensitivity training employees receive, if any. Um, what are the contractual criteria for a cleanup to be deemed complete? Uh, if there is to be increased uniform presence Will the performance of these individuals be assessed not just based on public safety criteria, but also on environmental ones, um, among others? And then last but not least, to the extent this overlaps with the Boulder Creek Management Plan, you know, what does the strategic planning process for that policy look like in light of these programs and what benchmarks are being considered? I think more fundamentally, um, and here I'm echoing sentiments that a number of you have already uh, voiced, Given that this is not an insignificant deployment of resources, I feel that the public should have access to rail data in order to follow along and track in assessing outcomes and determining whether or not these programs ultimately do anything to address the issues which led to their adoption. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much again for your time. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> Next, we have Kathy Joyner and Jim McMillan will be our last speaker. Kathy, you're up. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, council members. I'm here to make a last request that council approve the CU South annexation agreement. 
After years of work by staff, boards, and council, and a robust and productive community engagement process, this agreement will, above all else, allow flood protection to move forward expeditiously. If you approve this agreement tonight, you will be fulfilling one of the local government's most fundamental responsibilities, the protection of the health and safety of its citizens. If approved, this flood protection undertaking will ensure life safety of 2,300 residents who are currently at significant risk. As this project will be years in the making, even if all goes as planned, we don't have another year to lose given the increased frequency of climate extreme events. Assurances to regulatory agencies that the city has management authority over lands for which it is requesting permits will ensure that required permitting is not delayed for an unknown period of time. On a final note, I feel the need to recognize the passion and commitment of all who have worked on this project, regardless of positions. Irrespective of your decision tonight, you know that you will not be able to please everyone. Still, your efforts are important and appreciated. Once more, to council, staff, and boards, thank you for your perseverance and dedication to help ensure the safety of so many. And an additional thanks to the countless members of the public who have been involved with community engagement efforts over the past years. It has helped make this draft agreement a far better document. Please take action tonight to ensure that flood protection moves forward without delay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> and our last speaker tonight is Jim McMillan. Jim? Yeah, you can hear me? You can. Uh, well, good evening, council members. My name is Jim McMillan. I'm a 31-year resident of Boulder. I appreciate your service to our community, but I'm extremely disappointed that you're seriously considering passing the highly flawed, ill-considered annexation agreement uh, associated with the CU South land parcel. This is the most monumental annexation considered in many decades, and it's being pushed forward with false arguments that it will bring immediate benefits to Boulder, namely flood mitigation to the West Valley, especially Fraser, and, and housing to CU Boulder to reduce in commuting. The claim of proposed 100 year flood mitigation being adequate and protecting Fraser is highly misleading. Uh, there are many drainages that contribute to flooding of the West Valley, and as the FEMA study showed, only 30% of the flooding in 2013 came from South Boulder Creek, with the balance coming from other sources such as Bear Creek. The claim that housing stock will be, incre be increased is perhaps true, but only in the distant future as CU doesn't have detailed site plan or even a timeline for establishing any housing. Good decision making is rarely made when one has a proverbial gun to their head, and this trumped up sense of false urgency is most unhelpful and a disservice to our community. We need real flood mitigation and real housing solutions. Many residents of Boulder like me moved here and willingly pay higher taxes because of Boulder's green values, which will be thrown under the bus by this annexation, which is highly risky to the critical endangered uh, habitat, uh, the state natural protected area near the site. And I just emphasize once wetlands are gone, they're gone permanently. And once critical habitat is destroyed, it can't be brought back. Again, consider your legacy, uh, Council. Do you really want to be known as the Council that destroyed Boulder's avowed green credentials? Um, it's it's anti-democratic to get in front of this um, of the Citizens Initiative, that's uh, uh, Initiative 302 on the November ballot. Please wait until after that to consider this, this annexation agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> and it looks like Riley Mancuso has made it into the meeting. So Riley, you are up and you have two minutes when you're ready. Good evening, council. It's me, Riley Mancuso, and I am calling in to urge you to call up the 2504 Spruce Street project for council review. Um, the uh, push the current push from the planning board to include just 14 large and expensive units and only two permanently affordable units when other proposals uh, support many more apartments on the site um, in the 900 to 1600 square foot range. Um, we really need to make sure that this spot, which is in a very central location in Boulder, close to major transportation hubs and major commercial centers, is used to provide effective affordable housing for our community. Um, if there is any place in Boulder where denser housing makes sense, it is near 
28th Street. It is near Pearl Street. It is near the major thoroughfares um, where people can get by without cars and get to the um, retail and dining and childcare and medical and administrative and all sorts of offices where lower income workers need to get to work. Um, and so this is just a really excellent opportunity for you all to walk the walk on how much you talk about investing in affordable housing. Um, really Boulder has this, this decades long deficit of anti-growth uh, down zoning um, that um, uh, has created years of deficits of housing construction have created a debt. Um, and now Boulder just really needs to aggressively pursue new housing construction. And when it, and the compromise with that for the people who say that new construction is bad is that whatever new construction there is should be housing the maximum number of people and the maximum number of low-income workers who are not you, thank interested. You, thank in you, Riley. Square foot. Your, your time is up. And I will also let you know that um, the call up for 2504 Spruce has been moved to September 28th. So we got your input. Uh, you'd like us to call it up and that action will be taken or not at the meeting on September 28th, if you would like to attend that. And with that, um, I'll bring open comment to a close and turn it back to you, Alicia. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I have failed to do my duty, which is uh, turn to staff and council and see if there's any response to what we've heard. So I'll start with you, Nuria. Any response to open comment? Uh, just a thanks again. We take every comment that comes our way, and particularly those today that were about um, waste efforts and, and homelessness know that we will be discussing those with staff and we'll be certainly taking those into consideration, but thank you. Thank you, Nuria. Sandra, any comments from city attorney? I don't see any. With that, I'll turn to council and I see Rachel and Bob have their hands up. Rachel. Thanks, Sam. Um, I wanted to speak, I think, to the same community member that, that Nuria was thanking, um, Ashlyn, I believe her name was who is uh, undertaking cleanup efforts uh, along Boulder Creek. So I wanted to say first, thank you for doing that. And um, second, I don't know what the protocol would be, but it is something that I raised in the past, why, why we don't have more receptacles there. So sounds like Nuria, you're gonna maybe investigate that and see if it would help. But Happy I, to do so. Okay, I can't, I can't direct that. So I don't know if that needs a nod of five, but <laughs> that sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Bob. Yeah, I wanted to, to um, respond or address um, Mr. Tang's comment about the, um, the programs that, that we approved this summer and, and some of which I know that are still being put in place. So it may be a little bit early to have a report, but I'm wondering, Nuria, do you think that uh, you and your team will be in a position to issue a report either um, at a study session or in writing uh, sometime this fall on, on some of the changes we need made around uh, fleet staffing, ranger, ambassadors, cleanup crews, those types of things? I, I don't recall that. Thank you, um, Bob. I don't recall the timing, but we are certainly actually actively meeting. We are talking about um, and have incorporated other people, including our innovation and technology folks to see how we measure our progress and how we measure our activities. Uh, and so we, I will go back and talk about when we can provide a substantive update to what that looks like. I know we were going to do one, or I believe we were gonna do one before the end of the year, but I can certainly get back to council and please know that we are actively talking about all these measures and how to move our work forward. Thank you, Nuria. All right, thank you, council. And Sandra, I see that you're back on. Did the city attorney's office have any response to anything you heard at open comment? No, I did not. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. All right. And with that, Alicia, I will turn it back to you. All right, sir. Thank you. Our next item on this agenda is our consent agenda, item 3A, and that will include, uh, I'm sorry, items 3A through D. All right, super. Um, council, uh, looks like this is a show of hands. So do we have any questions, feedback or a motion on the consent agenda? 
I move the consent agenda. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second for the consent agenda. Because this is a show of hands, I'll ask, does anyone object to passing the consent agenda? Great. Seeing no objection, that passes unanimously. And back to you, Alicia. All right, sir. Next, we have our item number four, which is our call-up check-in. 4A is the call-up consideration item related to the community and environmental assessment process for the East Arapaho multi-use path and transit stop enhancement project. Uh, very good. Um, Aaron, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I've, no, I have no desire to call this up. I just want to speak to it briefly. I'm really happy to see this coming forward. It's going to fill in some critical gaps in the multi-use path system on East Arapahoe, which have been much needed for many years. And uh, we did get a fair amount of federal funding for this project through the uh, grant from the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, so really great to see us leveraging our transportation dollars and getting this project done. So thanks to everyone on staff uh, for moving this forward. Super. Um, I'll just comment that I agree with everything Aaron said, and we should thank Aaron as our representative to Dr. Cog for getting some of that funding for us. So thank you, Aaron. Council, any desire to call this up? All right, very good. Um, and with that, Alicia, back to you to tee up the next item, please. All right, sir. Next we have item number five on public hearings. 5A is the continued public hearing and consideration of the following items related to a petition to annex a 308.15 acre parcel, generally known as CU South at 4886 and 5278 Table Mesa Drive, 718 Marshall Road, zero Highway 36, two parcels, and 4745 West Moorhead with initial zoning designation of public related to LUR 2019-00010. First item is a consideration of a motion to adopt resolution 1295, setting forth findings of fact and conclusions regarding the annexation of approximately 308.15 acres of land, generally known as CU South, and located at 4886 and 5278 Table Mesa Drive, zero highway 36, two parcels, 718 Marshall Road and 4745 West Moorhead. And if resolution 1295 is adopted by council finding that the area may be annexed, continued second reading and consideration of a motion to adopt ordinance 8483 annexing the city of Boulder, approximately 308.15 acres of land, generally known as CU South, located at 4886 and 5278 Table Mesa Drive, zero highway 36, two parcels, 718 Marshall Road, and 4745 West Moorhead, with an initial zoning classification of public as described in chapter 9-5, modular zone system of the BRC 1981, amending the zoning district map, forming a part of said charter to include the property in the above mentioned zoning district and setting forth related details. Or the continued second reading and consideration of a motion to adopt by emergency measure, ordinance 8483, annexing to the city of Boulder approximately 308.15 acres of land, generally known as CU South, located at 4886 and 5278 Table Mesa Drive, zero highway 36, two parcels, 718 Marshall Road and 4745 West Moorhead with an initial zoning classification of public as described in chapter 9-5 modular zone systems of the BRC 1981, amending the zoning district map forming a part of said chapter to include the property in the above mentioned zoning district and setting forth related details. Thank you, Alicia. And before we move on, I will turn now to Bob. Uh, thanks, Sam. I, for reasons uh, previously stated, I'm going to recuse myself from the matters that Alicia just announced. I'm going to depart the meeting and I wish you all a good evening. Thank you, Bob. Okay, very good. And I have 
a couple more items here. Give me a moment. Um, so just a reminder, we have heard Council Member Yates recuse himself. Uh, just a reminder that Council Member Joseph has also recused herself. Um, our city attorney, Sandra Yanes, explained uh, last week uh, the, the reason for those recusals. So these are continued recusals um, because the hearing has been continued. And then finally, I would turn to Council Member Nagel and ask um, Council Member, because you were absent last week, have you had a chance to review the recording of the September 14th meeting? Yes, thank you, Sam. I'm all caught up. Okay, very good. Um, and with that, um, I, I will um, remind everyone that this is a continued second reading hearing. We have taken the um, public testimony on this item and we are turning now to council for deliberations, discussion, and any motion um, or motions on these items. And I think the first thing that we probably need to do as a council is make sure that we agree on how we want to structure our discussion going forward. So with that, I will see if, um, Sandra, do you have a slide? I do, yes. if somebody could bring up the- I see the slide deck on the screen, it just needs to move to the next slide. Perfect, okay. So um, yesterday I put out on hotline just a concept for how we could um, structure these discussions. I only received one bit of feedback that was from Mary, which she posted then on hotline. So we've all seen that. And I would just turn now to council and um, say uh, the, the structure I'm gonna propose for discussions, I guess I'll start by saying, we would normally have handled this at CAC, but at CAC this week, two of the members are the recused members tonight. So I thought I should just bring this directly to the, those of us who will be hearing this item. Um, <clears throat> I would recommend that we start by hearing from staff on a couple of things. Um, first of all, what we need to do tonight. And second, um, what changes there might have been to the annexation agreement since uh, last week. And then after we've heard from staff, I would move to council for questions. Um, the questions that I, uh, the way I would structure those is questions on last week's public hearing, what we heard at the public hearing, and then any clarifying questions on the changes to the annexation agreement that have occurred since last week. And then finally, uh, any questions council might have before we go into discussions of, of staff or the applicant. I believe that we have the university here as the applicant um, and they are ready to answer questions. Um, after questions, I would suggest then that we turn to um, our discussion and I propose six different items that we could have as topic areas so that we can organize our discussion. After that, then um, motion, if any, on the resolution, motions, if any, on the annexation ordinances in front of us, and then finally check with the city attorney that this has all been completed and done properly, and then uh, final closing comments from CU and council. So that is my proposal. Um, that I would turn to council for any comments, questions, feedback, and at the very least, I'll need some thumbs up if you agree that this is a way for us to move forward. I'm seeing three, four, five, six thumbs up. Okay, so great. Well, thank you, that was super easy. And it looks like this will be our agenda for this item tonight. And with that, I will turn to staff. Great, thank you, Sam. Good evening, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the hard work and collaborative efforts of the legal team. This project has touched everyone at the CAO in one way or another, and I want to acknowledge your contributions. In particular, I wanna share my gratitude to Aaron Poe, Kathy Haddock, Luis Toro, Hella Panawig, Rewa Ward, Desiree Aguirres, Julia Chase, and a huge thanks to our outside advisors, Jeff Wilson, Jerry Dahl, and David Gear. 
And with that, I think we can move into the more procedural aspects of tonight's hearing. Next slide, please. There are two resolutions that are part of this annexation. The first resolution, 1289, was approved on consent at first reading on August 10th of 2021. The purpose of resolution 1289 was to make preliminary findings required by the annexation statute and to set the date of the public hearing. The second resolution, resolution 1295, is part of the second reading of the annexation ordinance. The purpose of this resolution is to make final findings of fact determined from matters presented at the public hearing. Those findings by resolution are required by the annexation statute prior to approval of the ordinance. The resolution and ordinance are two separate actions. Traditionally, the city has included the findings of fact, the second re resolution essentially, in the annexation ordinance. The annexation statute requires a separate resolution, and while it should be adequate to include it in the ordinance, I recommended strict compliance with the statute out of an abundance of caution. The findings are found in the resolution 1295 in your packet. Next slide, please. Basis for emergency finding. So the Council Rules of Procedure 7F and Charter 17 address the basis for an emergency finding. Essentially, they are findings of urgency and need and matters affecting life, health, or safety. This slide is a representation of the Council Rules of Procedure. The next slide is going to be uh, Charter Section 17. Next slide, please. And as you can see, um, the charter section 17 calls for a requirement of a showing of preservation of the public peace, health or property. And uh, it also requires a two thirds vote of any members that are present in order to pass by emergency. The findings um, for emergency are found in ordinance the emergency ordinance 84, 83, paragraph eight. Next slide, please. There was a question asked or uh, perhaps a statement made at the last hearing regarding special privilege and uh, an allegation or contention that um, emergency orders couldn't be passed for um, a franchise or a special privilege and that the annexation is a special privilege. Franchises and special grants refer to special grants of use of city property or exclusive contracts for government services that allow the beneficiaries to have access to government property in a way that's not provided to others. Common examples of franchises um, are for electric, gas, transportation, or cable services while special privilege contracts, um, for example, are like the exclusive provider of a trash removal in a specific area. An, ex an annexation ordinance and agreement are not a special privilege because any person or entity that is eligible to be annexed into the city can file an annexation petition and request annexation. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, a suggested, some suggested motion language for council. If they do decide to um, adopt the ordinance, um, because we have some changes to the agreement that have been made uh, subsequent to the, the September 14th meeting, we've added in the highlighted area some additional uh, language to address that. So that's something that if needed, we can come back to later on. And I just wanna say with respect to this, um, this uh, slide um, that staff's recommendation is that the annexation be approved on an emergency basis. There are compelling life safety issues. 
Um, during last week's presentation, staff showed photos of the floodwaters rushing down a city street just north of US 36. And the public testimony last week included numerous accounts of 2013 flood and near misses experienced by members of our community. And that's some of the uh, testimony and, and information that you heard last week in, in the presentation and as well as from community members. And for those reasons, um, staff is recommending that council move forward on an emergency basis. At this point in time, I'm gonna hand it off to Deputy City Attorney Aaron Pohl, who will review the most recent changes to the annexation agreement. Thank you very much, Sandra. Could I please have slide number eight? Good evening, Mayor Weaver and members of council. I'm Erin Poe, Deputy City Attorney. The negotiation teams have made four edits to the agreement since the council meeting last week based on council member feedback. These changes have been agreed to by CU and provided via hotline. The first change has been to paragraph 14A Language has been added regarding the IGA for a baseline study of light and noise impacts on the state natural area. In addition to establishing a baseline, the study will also define adverse material impacts to the state natural area and provide guidance on how to minimize any impact. The IGA will include the requirement that if there are material adverse impacts to the state natural area, the parties will collaboratively attempt to address the impacts at the university's expense. The second change was to paragraph 14C, and the only change to that section was that the for former first sentence was amended and relocated to paragraph 14A. There were no other changes. The third change was to paragraph 20, in the introductory section about the development zones permitted and prohibited uses, intent language was added to clarify that the university will develop the area consistent with 15 minute neighborhoods as envisioned by the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Intent language was also added regarding the university's goal to maximize energy efficiency and achieve 100% emissions reduction by 2050. The last change was to paragraph 24D about access. The change clarified that roadway access to CU's property will be rule-based, not role-based, to prohibit use of roads as a bypass between Highway 93 and Foothills Parkway. I have slides showing the track changes of those sections if council's interested, or I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Erin. And I believe, Sandra, we're ready to turn it over to council. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, super. And um, per what we just decided, um, it is now time for council questions. And so I, I think the uh, initial council questions that we want to focus on are any questions that we have based on what we heard at last week's public hearing. Um, so I'll turn first to uh, Mary Young. Mary, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask about last week? Yes, I do. Um, I asked um, four of them on hotline, and I was wondering if we could just um, go over those for the benefit of those folks who may be watching and do not have the hotline. Um, and the questions were, um, I will read them. Um, my first question was, what are the plans for implementing warning systems and evacuation plans and how do they relate to flood mitigation? Second question was, um, under what circumstances could future amendments slash changes to the annexation agreement occur and what would the process look like? And my third question was, how do environmental impact statements and other required analyses of endangered and threatened species fit into proposed flood mitigation and is the city violating any rules? So those were the three questions that I asked on the hotline. I have others, but if we could start by addressing those, um, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Super, thank you, Mary. And uh, I will turn to staff for the answer to those three. Joe, are you the first one? 
I think I'm the first one. Phil is probably the, the second and uh, me or the uh, open space staff are the third. But before I start, I uh, just want to introduce myself. I'm Joe Tadeucci. I'm the director of, of utilities. Our department is responsible for the flood mitigation project that um, coincides with this annexation agreement. The property that's potentially being annexed uh, is needed for our flood project. So um, the, the first question about the plans for warning system and evacuation plans and how they relate to to flood mitigation. Uh, we do have warning systems and emergency plans uh, in place in the city of Boulder. We, the, the National Weather Service, the Mile High Flood District, and our Boulder City and County op Office of Emergency Management um, all coordinate on those things. And our city utilities staff have a supporting role in those situations. And we frequently provide technical support when there's a, a situation like a flood or a fire. And many of us end up spending time at the emergency operations center when one of those events occur. And uh, we've had quite a bit of staff transition since the 2013 flood in, in our uh, utilities and stormwater and flood utility. Uh, for me and Brandon Coleman, our project manager, we, we really came into the scene in uh, 2019. And uh, as we were going through the process in the last couple of years, we heard from community members uh, some specific concerns about what occurred with the US 36 overtopping in the middle of the night. And I, I hadn't heard that detail previously. And so, um, there seem to be some real valid concerns there. And so we assigned a staff lead to coordinate and project manage uh, efforts around that. We met with representatives from OEM and the Mile High Flood District uh, to explore opportunities for uh, future enhancements. We held community meetings with the people who were most impacted by the 2013 flood and the overtopping of US 36 and have established plans to install a camera uh, by the end of the year. And I appreciate uh, the, this, count, this question being asked on the hotline because I think one of the narratives that we heard in public uh, comment last week was that we really ought to be focusing our efforts on uh, early warning systems and evacuation plans and things like that that there is a concentrated effort already in place in those areas as I, as I described earlier here. And this has been uh, studied by a few generations of staff on this project. And there is one consistent message that I've heard and that is that the warning systems and evacuation plans and things like that are not a substitute for the flood mitigation. So um, that, Happy to, happy to say more about that. We have a website that, uh, that people can go to and get information for flood preparedness and, and get plugged into how you can sign up for cell phone alerts and, and things like that. And we do try to uh, put things in our utility bill inserts and, and so on and so forth. So Phil, uh, maybe you wanna address the second question, which is a totally different subject. Absolutely. Um, Phil Kleisler, um, with Planner with Planning and Development Services, thank you for your time this evening. Um, the second question regarding uh, amendments to the annexation agreement. Um, paragraph 59 in the agreement does anticipate that the parties could amend the agreement. Um, to do so is some, as a process similar to what we're going through now, the recommendation by the planning board and ultimately approval by city council. Um, so that, that paragraph, though, is um, just kind of clarifying this um, and that the parties can choose to amend the agreement, though it does require a motion by council. Thank you, Phil. And then the third question has to do with um, permitting, and, and I'm certainly not the city's expert on, on permitting. Brandon Coleman uh, knows it inside and out, as, does our, as do our open space staff. But I think the threshold question that uh, was there on hotline was, does the proposed flood mitigation uh, violate any, any permitting rules and, and how are things like environmental impact statements 
and those sorts of things impacted. And so to the threshold question, our project is being designed and planned uh, with the intention of being fully compliant with all permitting requirements as we go forward. And the, the um, as I mentioned in the hotline post with help from our open space staff, uh, NEPA would not be triggered because uh, there's not a federal agency that's constructing, <clears throat> constructing or funding the project. And the, the Corps of Engineers would be the lead federal agency that would be um, looking at this and, and um, reviewing it with respect to compliance with the Endangered Species Act. So uh, I will leave my comments to that if you, have, if you have more questions or if our open space staff have more to add. And I see John is on screen, mm -hmm. so. Good evening, Council. Uh, John Potter, Resource and Stewardship Manager, at Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. And Joe, I think that you you uh, got most of that. The only thing that I would add is uh, to the question of what types of assessments might be necessary for the project to proceed, and that would be uh, possibly a biological assessment that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service would call for to look at the two threatened species in the area. The uh, Ute ladies, tresses, orchid, and the prebles, meadow, jumping mouse, and they would be uh, then determining whether a biological opinion would be necessary and um, whether the project as uh, the utilities department proposes it would jeopardize the continued existence of a listed species or have impact to critical habitat. But as Joe mentioned, the project is currently being planned and designed to be in compliance with those permitting agency requirements. Thank you, John and Joe. Um, and so that addresses the, the questions that I posted on Hotline. I have some additional questions. And um, while Joe is on the line, um, I, was, I just wanted to ask um, a question that, um, well, it, it just keeps coming up um, with re respect to um, what, the constraints are that make the 500 year design infeasible. However, um, this afternoon, I received an email from a, um, a community member that um, shared with me a response from you, Joe, um, regarding a CORA request. And the response was basically, we don't have any document that says that the 500 year um, design is infeasible. Um, and if you could just elaborate on that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. And I appreciate the question. The, the topic of why we're doing 100-year design or 500-year design, I, I agree, Mary, keeps, keeps coming up. And in terms of the technical feasibility, um, the criteria we need to meet uh, with our project is we want to prevent US 36 from overtopping and flooding the West Valley as it did in 2013. And then we have this storage facility and we have outlet pipes that go under US 36 and convey water under, underneath and to the Vili channel on, on the north side of US 36. So we need to control flow through that proposed outlet work so that we don't increase flooding in that area where it dumps into the Vili channel. So there's a limit on how big the outlet works can be before we violate criteria there and cause a problem. And then we need to match the existing conditions on the US 36 bridge. And um, kind of a fundamental of floodplain regulations is that with our projects and our designs, we can't make things better in one place that we're trying to protect at the expense of another area and, and make things worse. And so with the 500 year flood uh, and specific to the US 36 bridge, when we did that modeling and when we optimized the project there, um, the best we could do was getting water underneath the US 36 bridge, but it was a foot deeper than the baseline conditions with the 500 year flood. And so for us and on the technical side, 
And I have graphics and, and things that kind of show the results of that modeling and, and what happened. And so only the 100 year design can meet those technical criteria. And I, in preparing for these meetings and, and Brandon, our project manager, who is our technical lead on this, ha has been out um, on parental leave for good reasons. And so it's given me the opportunity to talk to some of the, the people involved that normally a department director would not be so deep in the details. Part of this coincides with my background. And in the last couple of weeks, I've, I've met with representatives from the Mile High Flood District and our project lead there. I've talked to my counterpart at CDOT and their, their technical lead and reviewed everything. I've met a few times with our uh, design consultants and, and just looked at the technical reports myself and re-reviewed them. And I think um, the, the conversations I've had with the Department of Transportation and that Brandon has had all along and the key criterion that our team is trying to meet is matching, one of them is matching those existing conditions on the US 36 bridge. And as they further refine their design and they bring in uh, more refined topographic information and things like that, they're actually finding it's harder to meet that condition even for the 100 year flood than they originally did. And so when I talked to our design consultants this past Friday, the, the statement that they made to me is that we feel even more strongly now that the 500 year flood is not feasible and we're not able to match those existing conditions and balance all the technical things that we're trying to do to not make things better in one area and worse in another. And so um, that's, that's kind of the trajectory that we're on. And I know that there are some statements in the, in the report that we put out in early 2020 that probably caused some confusion because it indicated that we may be able, we might have been able to mitigate those effects. And part of that was that that, that report was documenting work that had been started in 2018 and was just trying to capture a couple of years worth of work. And it, it just has not proved out to be true that there are ways to mitigate those impacts for the 500 year flood. There are other issues and other considerations that. It's not just that alone, but as I came into the project with Brandon and, and I looked at all of the factors, my own independent opinion, having done this work and, and spent my whole career in water resources area and, and dams and projects like this and permitting and agency approvals and looking at all the constraints as a package, I just do not see a way to bring the 500 year project to something that is feasible and actually gets constructed. And I could not in good conscience recommend that the city invest additional funds in pursuing that. That is my professional opinion. Thank Mary, you. Would, would it be okay if I colloquied on this? Um, please do. So Joe, um, I appreciate that description from a technical standpoint. It jibes with everything that you and I have talked about over the last year or so about this project. I have another question. Um, there are other drainages in um, the Boulder area that we need to watch out for flood hazards on. And I was curious, have we ever done a 500 year flood level mitigation project on any of our other drainages? We have not. And uh, the, there's actually a, a figure in, a, in the presentation that Phil and I had last week in the backup slides that shows all of the different drainages and the level of conveyance that's available in them uh, currently. And, and we, have, we have some drainages like Gregory Creek, for example, we're designing and we're buying property and getting it out of the floodplain. There's an imminent project there that the best we can do is, is 10 year flood protection. And so um, the South Boulder Creek is really the only one where it's feasible for that to even be in the conversation 500 year, quite frankly. And in my, I mentioned the, 
making the rounds with some of the agencies. And when I talked to our uh, project representative from the Mile High Flood District, he reminded me that kind of the whole regulatory framework in the United States and FEMA and floodplain regulations and municipal organizations and how, how floodplains are designed and to be protected is around the hundred year flood. And so it would, especially for an old city like Boulder, it would be incredibly difficult to untangle ourselves from, from that level of flood protection. He also reminded me that in the hydrology that gets used for these studies, the, the historic rainfall and, and runoff that factors into the calculations that there's a lot of conservatism built in. And, and so I think his words were kind of the, the accounting for climate change is somewhat baked into the designs that, that we already do and the factors that we use. And so there's, I, I could probably talk for another half hour, but I'll leave it at that. No, that's super helpful. So it says that we have not done <clears throat> anything more than a hundred year in our other drainages. And then the last question that I've got is, um, you know, the RJH report from 2000 indicated that it would be some tens of millions of dollars more to do the 500 year flood project. And if, if we were to be able to do it, which is sounds like not possible, but if we were and if we spent those extra tens of millions of dollars to get to the 500 year flood protection level in this drainage, would that materially impact the city's ability to mitigate flood risk in other drainages? Well, if, if you consider that there's probably a limit to, I mean, we can always increase rates as much as we want to, to, to fund additional projects, but practically and realistically, there's a limit to, to the pressure that we can put on our utility customers at any one time to fund these. So um, in my opinion, it would delay work in other areas if we pursued that. Great. And, and from, a, well, I'll just leave it there and I'll turn to Mark. Mark, I see your hands up. Yeah, you know, I've been immersed in this for so long with such detail, I may be entirely misremembering things, but was it also not a factor that the landowner was resistant to a 500 year uh, flood scheme or is that, I'm just making that up? I, I think Phil might be able to, to fill in the details on the history of that. I do believe at one point there, there was a, a discussion with CU before Brandon and I came into the project. I, I will say that, you know, some of the public testimony, there's a perception that we chose, the city utilities staff have steered this project towards the 100-year flood based on CU's preferences. And, and I want to address that. That is not the case. We could have made the 500 or the 100 work with respect to the university's development plans. It would have been much more costly and much more complicated, but but we could have done that. And Phil, I don't know if you can. Um, yes, there was detail. there was a letter, and I don't know the exact date, sent by the university to council indicating um, uh, there um, that the university was not uh, the the design of which a 500 year flood uh, design was not acceptable due to the impacts to the development zone. And so when Joe talked about cost, that was relating to Phil and 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 providing um, the development area that we had previously agreed to in the comprehensive plan. Thank you for confirming that I, I still retain some shreds of memory. I, I will, but I'm realizing that we're still all colloquying on one of Mary's questions. So I took my hand down and I'm going to offer the floor back to Mary. Okay, super. Mary, back to Thanks. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I um, I guess I have a follow, a colloquy to my own question. Um, so uh, Sam brought up the RJH report and um, I spent some time yesterday reviewing that report. And one of the things that um, I read in there was about how the um, Army Corps of Engineers will not um, approve a project alternative when there is an alternative available that would have 
less of an impact. So I guess my question is, is um, it seems that within that report, there were several um, criteria that were addressed and it wasn't just about um, the ability to um, make the 500 year um, design come to fruition. And to what extent um, did staff consider in the recommendation, there's another matrix in there, uh, I believe it's table 7.1, that um, talks about it basically lays out all the options. And it's the, the one that I remember seeing um, in the memo when we, um, when we gave direction to go with the 100. And so to what extent is there, at what point do you step back and say, okay, there's more than just whether or not we can do the 100 year, 500 year, there's other factors and, um, and which, which were the biggest factors and to what extent do they um, influence um, the recommendation? So I mentioned the, the technical feasibility and, and the balancing act that we're trying to do with our outlet works and storage. That's certainly a big one. And all of the subsequent work that the team is doing on, on 100 year modeling and refining the design is, is really one of the primary things is focused on matching the a lot farther into the sensitive habitat that we're concerned about. And it makes the, it makes the geometry of the multi-use path and trying to reconfigure that to, to deal with our flood wall. Um, there's not really a, a practical option for that. So I'll let John add to the environmental considerations, but those were all the things that we were looking at and, and, and considering as we were uh, talking about feasibility and making recommendations to council. As well as the cost that Sam mentioned. Yes, and the cost. Thank you. John? Um, yeah, uh, I would just add uh, for council that I believe at the time uh, the Open Space Board of Trustees uh, recommended that the 100 year would likely have less impact than the 500 year on critical habitat for the Prebles Meadow Jumping Mouse. And that was a concern uh, from the open space standpoint to uh, favor the 100 year project over the 500 year. Thank you, John. I think that um, is all on that question, but I think some of these um, points kind of lead into my next question, which is another item that um, keeps coming up. Um, there has been some claims out there that no master plan was followed and, um, and questions about why um, South Boulder Creek was prioritized over other drainages and, and why didn't we um, go on cost benefit when there are other um, drainages that saw more cost based on the damage experienced in 2013. So if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, uh, and we actually, uh, coincident to, the, to this project, we're also doing an update on our storm, stormwater and flood master plan. And we just had the Water Resources Advisory Board meeting last night and did an update to the board on that effort. And that, that question came up and there was a master plan done for this in, in 2015. Kind of the short answer is we did a master plan as we would do for any of our drainages and, and we're following the recommendations and the, and the further steps that you would take after a master plan. So if there's a, if there's a perception that that wasn't done or we hadn't completed that step for this drainage, um, that's not the case. And then, uh, the, the question of benefit cost ratio, and <clears throat> if it's okay with you, I might just proactively address another uh, thing related to a memo we produced in 2014 and damages. And, and there have, some people have looked at that and said, wait a minute, only 30% of the, or, or something like that of the damage on uh, that occurred in the South Boulder Creek drainage was from the major, major drainage way. And I, I can see how people are looking at the memo and drawing that 
conclusion, but that's incorrect. And Phil, I don't know if you can pull up slide 66 really quickly while I'm talking here, but in that uh, memo, there's a table that shows all of the drainages and it, it attributes uh, damages based on surveys that uh, community members filled out and splits them up between different things. And if you look at the table, it, it, does, it does appear that South Boulder Creek would be a lower priority, but there's a, and I don't know if you can, you can see it, but there is a, uh, uh, a footnote that there were some outliers, individual large damage uh, items that were excluded from this. And there was one on the South Boulder Creek uh, that's the first list below the table. There's uh, a $10 million outlier that was excluded from these damages numbers. And if you add, and that actually is the Fraser Meadows uh, area. That's what that $10, $10 million represents. And that was one of the hardest hit um, parts of the community after the 2013 flood. If you add that back in, that that would make South Boulder Creek the second highest of the city's 16 drainages in the city. And I, we actually have an FAQ on that on our website because it has a, been a point of confusion and, the, and there's a lot more about benefit cost ratio and, and things that we're considering as we do our master plan that historically everything was focused on benefit cost ratio that doesn't, that doesn't really uh, bring equity and racial equity into the equation. And that approach would kind of, uh, if you think about damages and the most, the highest uh, property value areas that would point our flood projects to the most affluent areas of the city. So there are lots of considerations around that that I've also covered in an FAQ. And I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I, I captured uh, the response that you were looking for, Mary, but that that's kind of what I had in mind in that topic. Thank you. Um, no, I think I think that answers the question. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I think I, I if Rachel doesn't want to ask a question of Joe, I can move on to my next series of questions, which would probably be for Sandra. And I see Rachel's hand up. So Rachel, do you want to ask Joe a question before Joe gets off? Yeah, if we're going to just keep Joe in the hot seat, I will <laughs> ask a couple of Joe questions here. Um, thanks, Mary, for the invite. So um, just responding or trying to get clarification around some things we heard in public hearing last week. Um, first, did CU do something with the property? Um, maybe by shoring up the berm that, that caused the 2013 flood or somehow is there something about CU's history with CU South that, that made that flood happen or puts us in a worse position for flooding? That has been uh, uh, a narrative that's been out there in the community that uh, the CU's building a levy around the property has made the flooding worse. Uh, Brandon is leading the design team and our consultants in the modeling, and we actually uh, have modeled the various floods uh, both ways with the with the CU berm in place and, and with it removed. And the results of that modeling have showed it makes no difference. So uh, we would not agree with those statements. So, so if I could jump in briefly, Rachel, sorry to interrupt. Um, <clears throat> Joe, you said that CU had put the levy in. I think it's probably worth just being clear and crisp on this, that I believe that levy was built um, to protect the gravel mining operation. And then when CU bought the property, they shored it up a little bit and had it certified by FEMA. Does that sound right? Yep, I believe that's right. And um, when Phil has showed the land use maps on the on kind of the east and northern end of CU's property, it's it's almost like there's a, a backwards R shape. And that is, if you've been out there, that is the, and you've seen that embankment, that's the levy, the flood levy that we're talking about. Back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Joe. Um, I, I walk my dogs, I think, on the levee pretty regularly. Is that right? That's a heightened plane that we walk on. Um, okay, the, the only other question I have for you um, is we've gotten some, some questions around 
what's the rush here? Like if we're not really going to be able to put, you know, shovels into the ground for another three to five years, why are we annexing today? And so I just wanted to ask you um, if we didn't annex, would there be an impact on the flood mitigation process? Would there be delays? It's a fair question. And Phil, if I could ask for help one more time, if you could pull up uh, slide 20 from our, uh, which was one of yours from last week. It kind of, that's the one that shows sort of the whole property and the different land use. So looking at the, uh, you can ignore the table and the acreages, but uh, looking at the property map, what you're seeing here is the, the CU property and uh, the development, what the development plans that the university has on the property relative to the components of our flood mitigation project. And why, why it's important for this annexation agreement to get finalized at this point in time um, as we move into the, the permitting uh, approach and our, our final design is the, the annexation agreement really pins down the interaction between CU's property and our, and our flood components. Uh, for example, the, the inundation area that will occur when we flood and the earthen fill, we have to know where the university is going to develop to be able to know where to place that. A big part of the negotiations with the university was around what types of recreation facilities could go within the inundated area. And it's, it's fairly common in land use planning to have certain types of like soccer fields and things like that in areas that you know are gonna get flooded. And so working with them to, to sort that out. And then a big component was, and something the, the city team worked really hard at was uh, getting an agreement with the university to obtain all 119 acres of OSO to become city open space and the water rights that, that go with that property. That is really critical for us to be able to uh, have a place on site where we can mitigate the environmental impacts of our flood project. And so if all of those things about the university's development and how we agreed on them, their development area, the rec fields, the open space, if the agreement's left open and all of that's up in the air, we don't have the information we need to go to the permitting agencies and, and we can kind of be in a perpetual do loop of, of having to further refine our designs. And so this process really uh, was established and the schedule was established quite some time ago. And um, the, the team really needs a decision on this to be able to move forward without delays. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, no more questions from me for Joe. Thanks, Super. Mary. Mary, back to you. All right. Um, so my next question, so, um, one of the, the requirements of the ability to be able to pass um, by emergency is that is the findings of fact. And um, I'm wondering, um, Sandra, if you could just um, elaborate a little bit on exactly what constitutes a finding of fact. Sure, thank you, Mary, for the question. So, um, a finding is really found in the evidence in the record. And so that evidence can take the form of testimony, documents, any sort of things that are presented at the hearing itself. And so um, those findings are um, then considered by, the, by council in terms of their ultimate decision. And in addition to that, um, those um, Findings are found in your resolution and in the annexation ordinance as well. Thank you, Sandra. Um, my next question is, um, I'm not sure if it is for you or not, um, but another, 
uh, two other things that keep coming up is um, that that very little consideration was given to the land swap idea. And then the other um, one that keeps coming up is um, that the city didn't even explore condemnation. So if we could just, you know, sure, talk a little bit about those two um, options. I can then try and address the condemnation question and, and then maybe somebody else um, can take over the land swap. So this was before my time, but my understanding is that there was um, some legal research um, uh, into the issue of condemnation. And uh, we even reached out to a condemnation expert attorney uh, to see if it would be possible for the city to move forward on some on a condemnation with respect to state owned property. Um, the response that we got back, it was that it was a, a basically a case of first impression. So um, in terms of the um, ability for the case, for the city to move forward on something like that, we would be on really some unknown legal grounds. And um, because of that uncertainty, it wasn't pursued. And that's, that is my understanding. Uh, as I mentioned before, that was before my time, but um, that's pretty much all I can add to that. Thank you, Sandra. Mary, can I colloquy on that? Please do. Um, because I, I've, uh, comments have, have been sent to me to the extent that um, that condemnation might be possible um, on the basis of life, health and safety considerations. Um, and would that impact our analysis at all here? Or would it, I mean, would it change the result or? I, I wasn't privy to that analysis, but I'm sure that that was probably an issue that was raised when we reached out to that expert, um, particularly knowing the circumstances that we're in. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Mary, I can probably take the land swap question. Um, so the, the question that we've heard um, I, that this is referring to is whether or not there's been analysis done um, that would allow the city to exchange land it owns in what's called the Area 3 Planning Reserve in North Boulder um, for CU South. So essentially relocate CU South to the north part of the city and make the CU North. Um, for those um, tuning in, um, the Planning Reserve is roughly 500 acres in North Boulder. It's an interim classification in our comprehensive plan called Area 3 Planning Reserve. And it's interim in that there's a very detailed and thorough process by which the city and the county undergo to determine whether or not that area becomes part of the city. Um, and so there's several steps involved with that. Um, it's, it's lengthy on purpose because it's a large area, there's limited um, development constraints, and it's one of the kind of last remaining areas where we'll grow with Greenfield development as a city. Um, so as, as I mentioned, uh, roughly 500 acres in that area, the city um, owns um, uh, be, uh, around 240, 250 acres that it purchased with Parks and Rec funding. Um, in the 1990s. Um, and it was at that time purchased with the understanding that it's kind of on reserve for a regional park. Um, and then there's also 30 acres um, in that area um, managed by our housing um, uh, department. Um, and so just wanna note that we did have a study session with council about a, a year and a half ago in early, February of 2020, where council discussed this and staff provided a memo. Um, we talked about the steps in the process and the um, necessary delays it would cause um, in the flood mitigation project and the unknowns with uh, a number of things, including the disposal process for parks land that we own there. So the disposal process is, is somewhat similar to what we would, how we would dispose of open space. Um, and so um, due to the uncertainties and the time, timing constraints, um, there wasn't much interest with council to um, um, uh, move forward with that. Um, the first step in that process is called a baseline um, urban services study where we look at our capacity in the area to provide, provide urban services. And that's scheduled um, to be worked on heading into the 2025 Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan update. And so it's at that point where we would go through the next couple of steps um, if council so chooses um, to look at that area of the planning reserve. And so through that process, it's, it's most likely 2027 or so when, when it, it, be, it may become eligible for application. And I'm going to turn to Adam. Adam, is this a colloquy? Okay, super. You're up. Actually, I have two. Um, I didn't get to the 
previous question fast enough before Phil started answering. I didn't want to interrupt him. So um, do we have any approximation of when we uh, went to outside counsel about condemn uh, condemnation? Um, just, you know, the year even? Hmm. Uh, has, has anyone here been around long enough to know that? Hold on a second. I'm going to see if I can find an answer for you. Okay. Feel free to come back with the answer okay. when you have it. Um, I'll move on to my second colloquy. Um, as far as land swaps are concerned, uh, if CU, you know, hasn't developed any of the land at CU South, if this were to pass and the annexation agreement goes forward, is there opportunity for a land swap if um, the uh, North property is annexed and is that still a potential in the future, Phil? I suppose anything is a potential. Um, the university's position, and, and they are present tonight if they have any interest or, or, or need to also comment, um, was that um, in order to entertain those discussions, the land in the in the planning reserve would need to be eligible for annexation, so an area two, and that's when that's all those different steps that we that I kind of mentioned um, just overall um, that would likely last until 2020, 2027. Um, and so the timing is kind of, I, I, I don't know, I, it, it possibly could be open, but um, it's not something that um, seemed like a viable option in 2021. Yeah, thanks for the answer. So maybe we can ask that question directly of CU um, when we get to that part of the discussion, but so to, in all technicality, it, it is still a possibility in the, the future. Parties, yeah, if the parties can agree to an arrangement, then it, it certainly is a possibility. I think there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of robust plant community planning that needs to happen um, in North Boulder too, in order to, to have that conversation. Thanks, Bill. And Adam, if you would like, um, I believe the university is here. If you'd like to direct the question to the applicant about that, um, I think it's appropriate to do it now. Okay, I just didn't want to get out of line with. Uh, no, no, you're you're, okay. you're fine because you're colloquing, and I see CU's up here. So if we want to get them to unmute, um, I guess really the question, uh, CU folks, is uh, if we ended up annexing the um, planning reserve or part of the planning reserve into the city and it were an annex property, would it be something that you would consider um, engaging in discussions about a potential swap? So thank you, Mayor Weaver. Um, this is Pat O'Rourke. I'm here with uh, Chancellor Abby Benson and Derek Silva. Just so that everybody knows, we are in the chancellor's conference room as part of our fully vaccinated facility. So we're not masked, but we're in compliance with local public health ordinances, uh, just so you know. And I think the answer to the question is that if the parcel of land was annexed and we were talking about both having fully annexed properties, we don't want to be in a position where we would say we are unwilling to talk about that, but that we would really need the, to be talking about annexed parcels of property in order for this to be a comparable conversation. Thank you. Adam, do you have any follow-up with that? No, I totally understand that legally right now they're not uh, interchangeable. So um, just wanted to see if there's even a potential avenue there. So thank you. Great. Can I add something to that? Just yes, you, yes, you may. And then we'll get a mark. I, I just wanted to add that, um, and I think actually Phil may have already raised this, but just to point out that with uh, Parks property, there is a dual approval process that requires PRAB and council approval. And then there would still be the issue of paying back um, the Parks money if the property was disposed. And then also to follow up on your question, Adam, or with respect to how much time has passed since we sought out a opinion on condemnation that was um, within the past two years. 
Great. Thank you, Sandra. And Mark, is this a colloquy? In effect, yes. I, I'm, um, I don't know whether to direct it actually to you, Sam, or to Phil. Um, I assume if um, we wanted to rearrange our work plan uh, in the next council, we could create a higher priority for the urban uh, services study and, and moving forward on that, if, if, if that were the rule of council. I'll say I believe you absolutely could, and I'll turn to Phil and Sandra to see if there's other considerations. We, we could do that at any time. However, the subsequent steps in looking at the planning reserve have to happen at certain times, and the next step would be that major update to the comprehensive plan. Those steps are memorialized in our intergovernmental agreement with Boulder County that we adopt with the comprehensive plan. And so if we wanted to change the timing of those, we would probably need to approach Boulder County and to see if they would be open to those shifts in the agreement. But that, that, could, that approach could be made and, and those inquiries could be conducted. Am I, am I missing anything? Okay. I don't think so, Mark. There had been talk of kicking that off with this council, but COVID kind of put the kibosh on that with what happened um, to the requirements for planning um, staff and the loss of, of staff. So um, it had been considered in the subject of kind of speculation that we might come to this in 2021, but it, it did not happen because of staff constraints. And look, there's a long way from here to there, but at least steps can be taken if it's the will of council to do so. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I believe we're back to you, Mary. Okay. Well, thank you all for um, those in-depth responses, and I appreciate the colloquies. Um, my next question, I believe, would be for Sandra, and this is on another um, topic that um, keeps coming up as well, um, and that is um, regarding the two council members participating in negotiations. And so the question is, how is that not violating that um, committees be open to the public? Thank you for the question, Mary. Um, so as many of you know, charter section nine requires that all meetings of council or committees uh, be public. We've taken the position that in order to have a committee that a group of council members need to have authority delegated to them by the rest of council. This is not the case with Sam and Rachel's role with this project. The two council members were invited into the negotiations by the interim city manager to consult with them on matters of negotiation. They do not and did not speak for the council or for the city manager, but only for themselves. This arrangement does not fall into the definition of committee and as such, there, is, there are no issues with the state open meetings law. Um, so I hope that addresses your question. Yes, it, it does. And I guess I have um, just a follow-up question regarding um, this was a contract negotiation, is that correct? Yes. That was happening. And so are contract negotiations typically open to the public? Any contract negotiation? Not typically, no. It's considered work product. It's it's there are they are generally not public. Okay. I don't know of any situation where we've had a public contract negotiation, but it's possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I that's. That's all my questions. Awesome, <clears throat> okay. So thank you, Mary. Thank you everyone for those questions and colloquies. Next in our organization is, does anyone on council have questions about the four changes to the annexation agreement since last week? I see Rachel and Adam, Rachel. I actually just had a couple more. I didn't, I didn't get to a colloquy on Phil. Okay. <laughs> it, it's kind of it's kind of loose here. We're in questions, um, but any council member can ask any question at All any right, time. Right. So um, I think I just wanted to ask one question at this point because Mary um, was very thorough. Thank you, Mary, for those great questions. Um, so there was a question raised last week about why the contract did not include um, standards that would 
apply in the situation where the property is um, purchased by a private developer around green build standards. So CU has committed to some, um, some goals and, and maybe not standards, but at least some goals around um, what its environmental standards would be for the buildings at CU South. Is there a concern that we don't have something in the contract that would apply to private developers? We are not concerned as staff because typical city standards will apply. And so in this case, if council approves the annexation, then for 10 years, the city would be the only um, purchaser eligible to, to purchase land or, or be conveyed land on CU South. And so that 10 by the time that 10 year pro uh, uh, exclusive option expires, um, any if the land were sold to a private property owner, not only would they have to comply with all city regulations, including building codes, but also our, our net zero standards at that time, which will be stricter than they are now. Awesome. So just to, to make sure I heard that correctly, there will be standards that apply to private developers if it if it goes that route. It would Similar change it area. 31 at the earliest, at which point we'll have net zero standards in place. Yes. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, super. And then I've got Adam and Mark. Adam. Yeah, I wasn't ready to move on quite yet either. Sorry, Sam. Um, no, no problem. So my question is regarding something we heard in the presentation uh, last week, actually, and that's about who is eligible to annex the property into city services and what the timelines are for those different eligibilities. So I understand that I don't know the exact number of years. I think it's about 10 we have the exclusive ability to annex the property. And I just wanted another explanation on that and how that would play out into the future. So, so Adam, can I just ask a clarifying question before we go on? You yes. said we have the exclusive right to annex for 10 years. Do you mean to purchase from the university? Sorry, I'm talking about uh, the opportunity for a city like Superior to provide oh, okay. city services to the property. Um, there is, I can get the exact date, but there is an intergovernmental agreement between Boulder and Superior, and I believe Louisville along US 36. That agreement includes um, kind of areas of influence where the parties have agreed that we're not going to provide urban services to the other city's area of interest. And CU South is in the city of Boulder's area of interest. Um, that agreement, um, I believe, expires um, at the end of, uh, I think, in 2030. Uh, and so if not renewed, then that protection would not be there. And technically speaking, a city could possibly provide urban services to CU South. However, um, you know, that's, that's, um, that's all we know now. Um, oftentimes the county does approach those parties of, a, of an agreement like that to extend, renegotiate, and so on. Yeah, thanks for that, Phil. And do we know what that process, that IGA process looks like? Um, it's just county run and are, is it pretty normal for it to you know, be re-upped each time or are there changes made pretty regularly? What's, what are the sort of, you don't have to give me exact probabilities, but you know, what, what's the possibility? I, I suppose it would deter, depend on the parties and, and what um, is happening uh, in, in several years from now overall along the corridor, I will, I would say I'd point to the history of Boulder County and they've provided a lot of leadership in this regional intergovernmental collaboration with different intergovernmental agreements around growth and development and other things throughout the county. And so um, they're pretty good at it, I would, I would say. And um, overall, I would say Boulder and Boulder County, our relationship is strong. We've been doing this collaborative planning for a half century and um, I know we would certainly be working together closely when that time came to. All right, thanks, Phil. Uh, Mark. Um, uh, well, Sam, provide me with a little structure here. Is this an appropriate or an inappropriate time to ask questions about the emergency versus non-emergency? Any, anything you'd like to at this point. Okay, um, and then this goes back to legal, I guess. Um, uh, first, how common is the use of emergency standards in passing ordinances? I mean, is it something we do with any frequency? Uh, it, it is uh, something that we do with 
some definite frequency. I don't know the exact numbers, um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, you know, in, in double digits. And, uh, all right, in, in terms of um, finding a fact, does there have to be any temporal nexus between um, the conditions we're trying to address uh, and the use of the emergency provision? Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to prevent flood, you know, uh, threats to health, life and safety, but those are at a very indeterminate time in the future. Um, so do you need any, any relationship between those conditions and the use of the emergency procedure or not? The, the cases are a fine deference to the legislative bodies that find emergency findings. Um, they're not going to reweigh all of the evidence and they will, in most cases, defer to the legislative body's decision on those questions. So um, it's a relatively low threshold. And I guess my last question with respect to that is, um, we know there is, there is some practical benefit to passing this by emergency and that it allows us to continue to design and permit uh, even during the pendency of a referendum should that occur. Um, is that an impermissible basis for resorting to emergency procedures? Can that be part of our consideration that, that it allows us to move forward? Well, if, if you use the belt and suspenders approach, I suppose that's the case. Um, really the threshold question should be whether there's a public health safety issue. Um, there could be some procedural considerations taken as well, um, because certainly if the um, measure is allowed to move forward and to address the emergency, based on some procedural elements, then those could be taken into consideration as well. But really as a threshold matter, it's the former. And Sam, may, may I ask one unrelated question? Absolutely. Okay, I, I know there has been a language change with respect to making the agreement subject to uh, disposal of the land that we require by OSBT. As I recall, it was CU's position that that's a city agency and not an external agency, and we've got to be responsible for that. Um, now, knowing the people uh, as I do on OSBT, I'm more than happy to take my chances with their good judgment and professional uh, professionalism. So I'm, I'm happy of, you know, to, to go that route. But there's a second part of that, which is uh, there are provisions that actually permit another referendum uh, if, an, if a uh, disposal takes place. And so my question is, why don't we at least get a recognition that, that that's a factor uh, as we move forward? Because I really do not want to end up in a situation where the disposal itself is subject to a referendum. And for whatever mm -hmm. reason, that passes. And now we have no disposal. We have no flood mitigation project. And we're fully engaged um, with, with a fully vested um, CU South project. Um, so you have a position on, on just the second half of it. I, I, don't, I don't mind so much about OSBT because I'm, I'm willing to, to take my chances there, but a referendum is a referendum. And if they're subject to an existing referendum, why not subject to that as well? So I, I can try and answer that question for you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so we, we know the OSBT adopted a resolution that outlines the conditions that it would like satisfied if the property is disposed. And staff has attempted to address those concerns in the annexation agreement. A disposal is required pursuant to BRC 8811 and charter section 177. The disposal decision is also subject to a referendum. You are correct. If the decision to dispose is not approved by OSBT and city council, or an affirmative de decision is overturned in an, a referendum vote, the project wouldn't be able to be built in its current configuration. Um, the university has not supported adding the failure of disposal in the annexation agreement because it's a decision that's in the control of the city. 
This is not the case with all of the other regulatory agencies that are listed in the agreement. If the city were not able to meet its obligations under the annexation agreement, the university could request disconnection from the city. However, if so directed, the city could pursue other approaches to pursuing the project, including the consideration of litigation options or even amending the city's code and charter. So these are issues that would be addressed as they come up. And um, I, I hope that answers some of your questions. Well, well no, it, it does not because we're subject to a charter approved referendum on our action tonight. Um, and so my question is, why are we not subject to a referendum on the disposal? Again, I'm not worried so much about the actions of OSBT. I, th I think they'll behave in a, in a professional and rational way. Um, you know, I'm not worried about litigations and charter amendments. I'm simply saying that, that there's the possibility that a referendum of the voters declines to approve that um, disposal and then we are in a situation where we have a signed annexation agreement. We cannot get the primary benefit that we are seeking, which is flood mitigation. Um, and we are kind of left with a bag of air. So, uh, so Mark, Mark, may I ask, is there a question in here? Because uh, it sounds like some of this is a discussion between council members, but what, what's the question for staff? My question is, is there a principal difference between two different um, charter provisions calling for referenda that we should be subject to one and not subject to the other. I, I can answer that question, Mark. So you're, you're right, we are subject to both of those referendums. If a disposal is required um, for OSB, OSBT or OSMP, um, that disposal would be subject to a referendum. You, you are correct in that regard. Um, what isn't uh, what we don't know right now because it's too far into the future is whether that would be approved or not. And there's lots of different factors that could be that could occur between now and then that could require or um, allow for a disposal to happen. And I see Joe's uh, turn on his video. I don't know if he had anything else to add or somebody else did. Um, Joe? Yeah, I, did, I didn't have anything to add on, on okay. the topic. So I've got a couple of other hands, Mark, but I also think that um, to the extent that we get answers from staff, I think this is a important subject to discuss with the full council as well. So um, I see Rachel and then Mary. Yep, just a follow-up question for Sandra while we are on emergency. Um, and I'm sorry if this was answered earlier. I have uh, four dogs in my room and there were a couple of times when they were barking like just all the time. So I may have missed it. Um, but if, if we pass by emergency, does that somehow inhibit or limit direct democracy or uh, the right for people to referendum the annexation? Absolutely not. And, and I think actually Sam's uh, diagram that he put out on hotline is a good representation of that. It, it does, include, does not include the legal risks or any of the other nuances, but I think what it clearly shows is that in each circumstance, um, the voters would um, be entitled to uh, exercise their, vote, their right to vote in either circumstance. Okay, I just wanted to um, ask for that clarification because there's been, um, I think, some intimation that the emergency vote would somehow stamp out uh, direct democracy. So it, it's staff's opinion that that's not the case. Correct. Thank you. And Mary. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I, this is a, a question I believe for Sandra. Um, and this is another question in the category of things that keep coming up. And um, so what keeps coming up is, um, why can't we vote on this? Um, we voted for Excel. So if you could just um, explain what the difference is between why we voted on the Excel contract and um, why this didn't get put 
up to a vote of the people. Well, we're dealing with an annexation ordinance. And so that um, takes a legislative process according to our charter. Um, the, the idea that it would be required to go to a vote um, was attempted, I, I think several years ago, I don't recall now the, the, the actual year when that happened, but, but it failed. And so the voters had an opportunity to put something in the charter that would require um, a vote for any, any annexation. Uh, and that just didn't fall through or that fell through. So um, it, it's not something that is required under our charter and in our home rule city. Uh, and just to follow up, but a franchise uh, is required to go to a vote. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And the, the muni question was based around a franchise, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Mary, back to you. Great. Um, thank you, Sandra. And that um, that was a um, initiative um, ballot item and the year was 2006. And, and Mary, if I recall, year. sounds like you've got that up. Didn't that fail like 60% to 40% or something like that? Yes, correct. So the voters had an opportunity to put in our charter a requirement that we would vote on annexations. I believe it said larger than five acres and that provision failed. So it's not in our charter because people did vote on that. Is that the way you read that? Yes, that's correct. That's that's how I read it. Okay, that's super. That's correct. And that's all, yeah, that's all I have. That's That was the only other question I had. Thank you. And Mark, I just had one quick note um, in your questions about adoption by emergency. I had um, Taylor Ryman, thank you, Taylor, um, have a look at this council. Um, we have passed 17 measures by emergency. Some of them are the supplements, which we normally do by emergency. Some of them were COVID related, but let me tell you a few that we adopted by emergency that were not. The tents and propane tanks measure that we did this summer was adopted on emergency. Um, fees on scooters were adopted by emergency. Dockless bike share was adopted by emergency and the moratorium on, on um, uh, the scooters was also done by emergency. So I guess we have a history of this council having been able to do that without significant concern. So. And Taylor to the rescue. Yeah, okay. Any other questions, Council? So any of any kind, I, I specifically wanted to call out any questions on those four small changes to the annexation agreement or anything else. This is the time to ask any questions of staff you might have. Sandra. So I, I just have a clarification uh, to make regarding the IGA that we had um, discussed earlier. And um, the, um, the, the expiration date um, was actually incorrect. I believe it was, um, I have to go back and look at my notes. Mm. I'm not finding it now. 2023. <laughs> So um, it wasn't, uh, it doesn't expire in 2030, it's in 2023. Just wanted to make sure that that correct information was out there. Thanks. S super, and um, I, I think there are a couple, there's a super IGA and there's another one with Lafayette. And I think there's the one with Lafayette is like to 2030 and, and the super mm -hmm. IGA was 2023, so. Yep. Okay. Any other questions, Mary? I don't have a question. I just wanted to um, say thank you for um, the proposals that I put out on Hotline for um, changes to the annexation agreement all being um, included. Um, so just thank you for that um, to the negotiating team. Okay. That's all I have. All right, super. Okay, um, with that then, 
if we're done with questions, um, I had proposed six different topic areas for us to talk about. And these were really just kind of free form, discuss and any feedback. And then uh, if, if we don't have any specifics on those, we can go to each council member and talk about kind of our perspectives on this. So the first one that I had teed up uh, was about the structure of the agreement. Specifically, it provides de-annexation terms, um, obviously all the flood protection stuff we've heard about, first right of offer and refusal, the exchange of land and water rights. Is there anything that council would like to ask about that or discuss? I'm not seeing any bites there. How about the overall land use and zoning designation? This, I believe I'll ask a question just to confirm. Sandra, I believe that this will establish public zoning uh, for the whole property, uh, even though there are three different land use designations. Is that correct? I believe that's the case, um, but Phil, if you can that just correct. confirm that. Okay, and Phil, could you just give a small rationale for each of those land uses, why uh, we think, or why planning thinks the public uh, is appropriate for those? Absolutely, um, I have a couple of notes, um, but so just bear with me. The, um, the, as mentioned last week and in the memo, staff did find that um, the initial zoning of public was consistent with the three land use designations on the property. Um, and so the big question that council must answer is whether or not zoning of the annexed land is consistent with the goals and the land use designations of the comp plan, of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, and as, as summarized last week, the most um, um, clearly articulated goals of the comp plan is through the CU South guiding principles, which talk about what happens in different areas of the site that aligns with the three land use designations on the property. So there's one land use designation um, on the property called public that's 129 acres of the property. Um, we found that that was consistent with the initial zoning of public because the definition of a public land use specifically anticipates the university. Um, and it's also consistent with how the other CU uh, Boulder campuses are um, zoned in the city um, and, and, and the consistent with the land uses found on other campuses. Um, the other um, land use designation as Park Urban and Other um, uh, represents 60 acres of the property. Um, and the agreement um, in this case does allow flood mitigation, flood control and recreational pur pur purposes, um, which are both specifically um, uh, mentioned in the definition of the park urban other area. Um, and then the third land use designation on the property is open space other and that's 119 acres of the property. Um, there is no complementary um, zoning district for the open space other land use category. Mm -hmm. Um, but in um, our analysis, we did find that it's consistent with the public zoning district um, because the, the agreement will um, regulate the land, that portion of the property in a way that's consistent with the open space other definition. So, um, All right, super. Um, the, the few other topic areas I just wanted to make sure council members had a chance to speak to or weigh in on if you have any specific concerns or, or thoughts on. Um, conditions for development on the property. So the annexation agreement has a lot of focus on um, conditions required for development, things like the height plane, setbacks, um, phasing of different types of uses and the uses themselves which are permitted. Any desire, questions, comment, Adam? Yeah, during one of our discussions a while ago, I asked a question about phasing and the traffic studies um or just you know uh i know that the cu campus is supposed to be built in phases and obviously it would only make sense that with each phase a proportional amount of traffic would go into each phase um so you're not counting sort of the the full amount that is allotted for the entire property for each individual phase um where did we land with that phil that was something that the negotiating team did bring up, but we were not able to reach an agreement for incorporating that into the proposed annexation agreement. Um, we were able to reach agreement around phasing the property from north to the south, 
um, and specific points of measurement prior to development and in between phases of development. Um, but we were not able to reach agreement on um, doing kind of proportional um, uh, uh, trip, trip budgets, trip caps as development progresses. Um, but. So just for public knowledge, the, the full allotment will be allowable even in just the first phase. Yes, I, I, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And Mary. Just a question about, um, there, there's a limit of um, 2,000 square feet maximum size for a dwelling unit. Is that correct? Um, not, not entirely. Um, there was concern in our public process about the university building. Um, there's a two to one ratio of residential to non-residential. And so two square feet of residential can be constructed for every one square foot of non-residential. There was a concern under envisioning a scenario whereas there would be um, a, a low number of very large homes um, that would then allow for a lot of non-residential development. And so what we added into the agreement, and this was just through the public process um, where we learned this and heard this, um, was that in that ratio, um, the residential side, no matter how big the structure is, the unit, you can only count 2,000 square feet of it. And so if the university um, uh, built a 3,000 square foot home, only 2,000 square feet of that would count towards that um, ratio of residential to non-residential. So it doesn't limit the size of all units. But essentially it provides um, a sort of disincentive. Yeah, that was the goal. Thank you. That's all I have. Super. Any other discussion about the development requirements? All right, seeing none. Transportation points or issues. Adam, you asked one. Anyone else have a question, comment, feedback on transportation? Mary. Um, so just one of the one of the things that we've gotten emails about is um, why isn't there in the agreement um, a requirement to use real time um, monitoring? We heard that that was in the planning board's recommendation too, and so we did add. Um, a term around that the university will consider um, real time traffic monitoring, but it doesn't require it. Um, I think the um, I, I, I would let the university speak to their um, uh, approach, but um, overall, I think there was some concern with becoming too prescriptive because um, and, but still um, um, putting the statement in to the agreement so that when we do get to that stage, there is an expectation that that's considered. And, and, um, and so it, it's not a requirement though. Great, S super. And it, for, for this um, point, I, I would turn to the university and see if the university would like to talk about their intention as far as real time uh, traffic monitoring goes, because that has been something that's come up multiple times, and it's a uh, intent in our agreement, but it's not a requirement. So would you please speak to university, um, your thoughts can, on? Can I can I just call it too and invite the university to, to address why they didn't want to say yes to the phasing, tri trip caps applying to phasing as well, Adam's question? Super. That's two questions to you. Um, why don't you start with real-time monitoring and then move on to why don't the trip caps scale with the phasing? Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, Derek Silva, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Business Strategy here at the university. And with regard to the, um, uh, with regard to phasing, the, I'm going to start with the trip cap one first. For, with regard to phasing the trip cap, it, it just didn't seem practical uh, to take that on and especially to because it could absolutely result in, in a limiting of development and for reasons where there would not be sufficient traffic to have an impact right the traffic study identifies uh, different points of impact the traffic for the the traffic anticipated for the total amount of development 
Um, and that's what we've agreed to. So um, we're not, we did not want to uh, uh, agree to any phasing of that trip cap. It just becomes very, very burdensome. And uh, with regard to the other, what was the other question? It's a real-time traffic monitoring, Derek. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. so with the real-time traffic monitoring, we're open to whatever technological advances that would make the most sense to incorporate to be able to monitor that traffic. Uh, what we don't know is how that would work. There's also different offsets that uh, are agreed to in the agreement. And so any real-time monitoring would not take into account those offsets that we have otherwise agreed to. So Thank I you. think we're open to in the future though. Okay. Uh, Mary, any further on that or Adam? I don't have anything further and thank you all for the responses. Great, thank you. Okay, with that, our next subject is open space, environmental conditions, and I'll include disposal in this. And so Mark, I wanted to, um, to have an exchange with you on this point. Um, I, I think uh, when I think about process generally on this <clears throat> um, whole annexation, it seems to me like um, if we pass an annexation ordinance, then folks have the ability to, to gather signatures and cause a referendum. And if that referendum is certified, then there's a vote. You know, council will touch it. And then likely there would be a vote on whether or not the public in Boulder thinks this annexation agreement is acceptable. If it gets past that gate, then the voters have said the annexation is acceptable as an annexation agreement. And if at a future time, OSBT um, chooses not to dispose or um, there's a referendum and the referendum uh, chooses not to dispose land, which would cause a, a problem with the flood project, it seems like there's some alternatives there. One alternative Sandra talked about, which is um, a citizens group or council could send a uh, measure to the voters to change the charter, to dispose those four acres specifically. And so people in Boulder would have a chance to specifically weigh in on that again, if they wanted to. Um, it also seems like the flood project itself could be potentially changed if needed, because that would be a requirement at that point if the people voted to do that. Um, but it seems like everything about that subject is in the city's hands. So the city voters have a choice on trying to overturn the annexation agreement generally. And after that point, the annexation agreement is good. If in the future, for some reason, maybe the endangered species become even more endangered or some other factor changes, if at that time, the voters choose not to dispose because ultimately the voters will make this decision, um, then that is a choice that is made uh, in light of perhaps changed information. But there's a chance in the next year uh, for voters to weigh in on the annexation itself. And then in the future, there's a chance to weigh in on disposal. So to me, that seems like appropriate process and it seems like there's plenty of optionality and I wouldn't see that anything else would be needed in the agreement to cover these future conditions, which we may not know now. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that thought and I'm happy to hear any responses from you, but. Um, well, I guess my first one is to staff. You mentioned the possibility of changing the contours of the flood mitigation project, as that is the, um, the core uh, benefit that we're hoping to achieve out of all of this. I, my, I guess my question for staff is, is that even possible? If, if such a uh, disposal were, be, were to be contested by referendum and the referendum were to pass, um, is it actually one of our alternatives to, ch to change the, um, the nature of the flood mitigation project and work around that rejected disposal? I, I suppose it is. Uh, uh, we could revisit where the flood wall or, or components are placed. We have kind of gone through a process of elimination over many, many years to get to, to this variant one, 100. That is the basis of our design. But um, I, I think I'll leave it on at that. And if I, if I have further thoughts, I'll, I'll raise my hand. 
I, I guess my question, Joe, then would be assuming that um, for some reason uh, the voters chose not to overturn the annexation, but chose to overturn the disposal. Um, wouldn't one of the options be to greatly scale back the flood mitigation project to something that was less than the 100 year? Um, wh what would you do or what would a future Joe do in the case <laughs> where all of a sudden the voters have uh, let the annexation happen and then have not let the disposal of those four or five acres occur? What, what, would, what would a utilities department do? Well, I think the, the variant one option it, it's a it's a wide flat valley and the high ground on the east side is the us 36 embankment and the high ground on on the west side is over on the west edge of cu's property so anything we would do would have to span that whole uh portion of it and and so it, the 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 height of the flood wall would potentially be less if we were doing a, uh, a lesser level of design. But I, I think we might have to revisit the master plan process and, and, and maybe start from scratch. Let, let me get at this another way. Um, in anticipation that we may well have a referendum in 2022, what would be the timing of the disposal request, so that if there is a referendum on that, perhaps we can combine them all into um, <laughs> what one happy contest in 2022, as opposed to doing them in series. That, that's probably a, a question for Sandra. And, and I know that the disposal process does have an element that allows for uh, a vote. And so I'm not sure how that that all works, but maybe Dan and Sandra know. I'll just chime in by it's um, the disposal process does not ne um, necessarily, in fact, I'm not aware of one in which it ended up in a vote um, by the uh, the electorate, but there is a, uh, a process in place that would allow for it if after the affirmative vote by both OSBT and council, then there is a waiting period and during that waiting period, if there's a, uh, a petition that is signed by at least 5% of the electorate, then that would uh, then trigger it to go to referendum. So a disposal in and of itself doesn't sort of guarantee that there will be a vote of, uh, of the electorate on that issue. There has to be a threshold uh, through a petition period uh, that would have to be ad, uh, sort of adhered to before it would uh, necessitate that a vote. So Mark, the idea of combining it uh, with a November ballot at such and such a time, you, uh, that is assuming that that there is a vote, and uh, but there is a threshold first through a petition period that would need to be uh, uh, done. I'm really asking if it's something we, we plan to do um, well before the 2022 election, because as I said, I think we are better off um, having them both on, if there's going to be a referendum on a disposal. I think we're better off having it on the same ballot. I, I suspect they will both pass or both fail, um, but it will give us much more clarity in terms of how we proceed. So we have a couple other hands up and I think this is, uh, do you have a question for Dan before I move on to other input? I have, I have a colloquy. Okay, go ahead, Mary. Um, yeah, so Mark, you said something interesting about um, putting both of them in, on the ballot, um, should there be um, a certified referendum, that there, there would be that one, and then why not put these two on the ballot? So it, it occurred to me that um, one of the, the things that Sam mentioned was that um, we could put a charter amendment up for a vote, that disposed of the four acres. So you could, it's a possibility that you could just go ahead and put that charter amendment for a vote next year, regardless of what's going on. Um, so I guess that's a question for Sandra. And I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat that last part? It's, 
Are you asking yeah. about whether or not um, uh, the question of a referendum from the dis disposal question could be added to the uh, other referendum? No, what, what Sam mentioned was that you could, you could just essentially um, have a charter vote on um, the disposal of the four acres necessary for flood mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be um, a ballot item that's placed on the ballot by council. So is that something that could happen to kind of address the issue that Mark has brought up? That could be a way to, to take a, a different approach, a more proactive approach to the issue, yes. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to check on that. That's all I have. Thanks, Mary. And then I've got Rachel. Yeah, I guess I, I, it's a slight colloquy, just that um, I think a lot of this is getting into territory that the next council will have to decide. And um, I'm, I'm just worried that we're drifting, although I thought it was a great idea, Mary, like the, the notion of, of putting it to the voters. So, um, but, but I think we could be in for a long night as is. So just want to encourage us to stay on track. Okay. So uh, thanks for that, Rachel. And Mark, I, I agree with you that this is an issue that ultimately will have to get dealt with by hook or by crook in one way or another, but maybe we don't know enough tonight to go through all of the scenarios. And I guess the pertinent question to me is, does it affect the annexation agreement or not? It does sound like Rachel said to me, like this is uh, items for the next council to consider because the next council will have the benefit of knowing whether a referendum occurred and the next council will have a benefit of input from utilities and open space about um, when the appropriate time is to go to OSBT and ask for disposal. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, that brings us to the last, uh, Mary, I see your hand before I move on. Oh, it's an old hand, okay. Um, and then the last item that I had flagged for just kind of free uh, specific discussion was, um, passage by emergency measure or non-emergency measure, uh, should we choose to pass it. Uh, we've had a bunch of questions and discussion about that so far. Is there any other input, questions, feedback? All right, I see none. So uh, in what we said, as far as organizing this goes, is that we are ready really to begin council discussion and debate. So it's our night and this is the last item. So before we start that, I'll ask, does anybody want to break or shall we just power through? Raise your hand if you want to break. I see Adam's hand up. Mark, do you want to break? All right, Let, let's take a five minute break and we'll come back and we'll start with discussions.
All right, we are all back and Adam should be pleased because we're one minute early. Everyone's here. Super. <clears throat> all right, and I'll wait until I see Sandra and Nuria to make sure that we have our staff here. There is Sandra. Nuria, when you are back, if you could turn your camera on, that would be great. All right, well, I don't see Nuria's camera on, but um, I expect she will join us shortly. Um, last chance for questions. Otherwise, if it's okay with council, um, I'd like us to start discussions on the merits of the annexation agreement and um, move towards whatever motions we are gonna make. Everyone good with that? Super. If it's okay, I'm going to take a prerogative here and I'm going to kick us off on discussions if there's no objections. All right, seeing none, thank you. Um, so it's obvious that this is a really uh, important issue to our community and many folks are very passionate about it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Of course, the first one is that we have some critical values in Boulder around open space and land use, as well as some of the history that attends to this property. So I'm gonna try and frame up some of the history and I'll walk through what I think some of the key issues are and how I come down on those personally. So I think it's worth noting <clears throat> that this particular parcel of land was identified in the 1977 Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan as a area of land to be annexed into Boulder, it was contiguous with it, and it was envisioned at that time to be a subdivision. But I guess the way I read this is it's been intended to be a housing focused piece of land development for 45 years. Um, then at some point, the Flatiron Company came in, turned it into a gravel pit, uh, mined it, put up the levee, and then there was a controversy about reclamation or non-reclamation. And then in 1996, the university purchased that property, um, and there was controversy about that, how much it was paid for, um, whether the city should have been able to buy it, the terms of the purchase, whether or not CU was going to reclaim it or take down the levy, and so on and so forth. But all of that history is old. The CU purchase is 25 years ago now, and we must move on from the history dominating the conversation about this property. We have to take it for what it is, a piece of land, which is owned by the university and which we have interest in for open space and for flood mitigation. Um, and as part of kind of turning the corner and moving on in 2009, um, the city kicked off the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation study, which is 12 years ago. So we have been studying, talking about, and thinking about flood mitigation on this property for 12 years formally, and for some time before that, of course. And then we all know what happened in 2013. And in 2013, we got to see with our eyes what a 100 year flood event in this drainage looks like, what the overtopping looks like, what the life threat is like, and so on. With that knowledge, we went through the 2015 comp plan update and um, added the guiding principles around this property. 
to the comp plan. And it was clear to everyone, I think on council and in the community that we had teed up the um, foundation for an annexation discussion. That's the way it was framed in the comp plan. And I think that's the way that we all understood it. So to me, the 2017 comp plan adoption for the 2015 update was kind of us saying as a community, we want to turn the corner on the history and we want to make this land into something that serves the community. Um, the first element of thinking about anything about this has got to be the flood issue. And we know that it's a critical life safety threat. In fact, some of the most sudden and violent flash flooding potential in the entire city is on this drainage way. And in addition, we as a community have declared that we are in a climate emergency, which magnifies the risk, not only the frequency, <clears throat> but the intensity of these kinds of flooding events, which we also know that we are the community in Colorado with the single highest risk of flooding. So we know that we're first in line for uh, big floods. We know that the climate emergency is making this worse. And we have a recent event that shows us how dangerous this is. Our responsibility as a council, obviously our highest priority is protecting life, health, and property and doing so in a way which is equitable to everyone. We've had some discussion tonight about the 100 year versus 500 year. I just want to concentrate on the 100 year plan, which we have um, established as our going forward plan and talk about what the benefits are. Well, in that flood that occurred in 2013, had this project been in place, all those waters would have been contained. There would have been no overtopping of 36. US 36 would have remained open for the entire duration of that flood. And much of the life threat and property damage that occurred due to overtopping would not have. So that's one advantage of a 100 year flood project there. There will be bigger events in the lifetime of this project in Boulder. There will be events which are more than the 100 year event, but a 100 year project will have many positive impacts. The first of which is that it will delay the overtopping significantly. Um, a 100 year plan in a 500 year flood event will detain about 55% of the water that would ultimately have overtopped US 36. And so, it will keep US 36 open for longer. It will allow for more warning for people who are in harm's way in that drainage. And it will allow more time to evacuate people. If we remember the accounts of people at Fraser Meadows, they were suddenly flooded and they didn't expect it. And one of the things that will happen with the additional detention in the 100 year project is that there'll be more time to respond and get people out of harm's way. The annexation of this property is the most clear and timely pathway to flood protection. And the reason why at the top line for me is that it's the most comprehensive and it's the most practical way to balance all of the, the critical values on the property. We need land for flood protection and detention. That's the direct 36 acres we need, but we also need the 119 acres for habitat protection and expansion that will be in open space. We have to get that land and water rights for that habitat in order to be able to mitigate any environmental damage due to the flood project itself. So as Joe has told us, it is not just that we need the 36 acres, it's that we need the entire package and not just the land, we need the water rights in order to be able to restore the habitat um, that has been inside the levee and dried out into its former wetlands status. And we need this as a mitigation bank for the flood project itself so that whatever environmental damage we do, we can take care of and the permitting agencies will then be able to give us permits based on having done what we needed to do for the environmental values on the land. I will also emphasize that as part of this project, we have not allowed development in the floodplain on this property. That is critical because we have said that we, you know, one of the things which causes flood damage is putting buildings in the floodplain. So we have kept 
all development out of even the 500 year floodplain, which is not regulatory, but that was part of the agreement we made in the guiding principles. Another way in which this annexation serves flood protection. Um, then <clears throat> I think the other thing to remember about annexation and flood protection is this annexation comprehensive agreement brings all of that to the table. And so we have a flood need, we have a flood plan, and this annexation is the critical next step in keeping us moving forward and realizing our flood plan. Another thing about this um, annexation that I think we need to remember is that not only is it a fair exchange of value between the city and the university, it's reversible if our half of the deal doesn't occur due to third party um, permits. So the deal we're making is see you, we will annex this land and give you our services, our water and, and um, sewer and flood. And in exchange, we get the ability to do our flood project. And CU has very fairly agreed that if we do not get the permits to allow us to do the flood projects because they're denied for reasons that are outside of our control, we can reverse the annexation and um, go back to the conditions we were in before the agreement. That is quite fair. Um, it also allows the city a great deal of control of development through the annexation agreement. So points have been raised that we do not have approval authority of the development, which is gonna occur on this property after we annex, and that is true. However, we'll have uh, all of the controls which are built into the agreement, as well as collaboration, um, I'll call them opportunities, but really they're almost required for us to be able to work together as CU develops the property to make sure that things like light and noise don't overly impact open space and that we are managing the traffic situation between the two parties in a way that is good for, for both parties. Um, the other thing I'll say about annexation is if we don't, then what can occur? Well, there could potentially be 10 mansions. Um, out here, or there could be a very large solar farm covering the area, and none of that would be in our control or really even influence if we don't do this annexation, that would all be decided between the county and the university, and I don't think we want that to happen. Another point that I think is critical here is that all of our open space values are well served by this project and they're required, as I said, to be um, part of the flood project mitigation. So we get 119 acres. This is the best riparian habitat in the footprint of this land. And it's, it's um, open space that we knew for a long time that we wanted. We also get the water. Um, that was a, a significant point in negotiation with the university. And it, the way it's resolved, will allow us to be able to make that land into what it was before gravel mining happened on that property. Um, <clears throat> the levee will be removed. That levee, which was put in place to dewater the gravel mining has always been something I thought should be gone. And not only will it be removed, we'll reuse the earth and the earthen dam of the flood project, which is classic boulder recycling. Um, and then again, no development in the floodplain um, is all part of this open space transfer. And then an additional piece that's come in near the end that I think is very important is we have restrictions on light and noise impact um, in the state natural area and on our open space. And that has been something that I think was really critical to being able to bring everyone on board around the natural values in this area. Um, development on this property is much needed in the sense that we need housing. We have a housing crisis in Boulder because there's not enough affordable housing. And we often ask the university, would you please build more housing for your students? And in this case, it's intended for students, faculty, and staff. Those structures will only be allowed on 40% of this footprint. And I think that's important to realize that the university has essentially given up 60% of this land to either be fields or to be completely undeveloped or to be used in our flood project. Um, we've made housing predominant use by at least a factor of two. 
there will be five acres of permanently affordable housing which are accessible to the entire community. So that's a benefit that goes outside of just the university. Um, the two acres which could be used for a public um, safety facility will not necessarily displace any existing um, fire stations or any existing um, police posts. So I think it should be realized that even though there's the possibility that we will have an additional public safety facility there, it does not imply that we will necessarily close or remove any others. We control the height of the buildings on this site. That is something that wouldn't happen unless there were an annexation agreement. And then the buildings themselves are limited in footprint and there's a hard cap on non-residential development here. Transportation impacts are managed in a way that is unique to this project and this site, and it's enforced through the annexation agreement. Um, I think some of the other deal points are worth noting as amazing to me that we've been able to get here, but very pleased that if uh, this annexation goes through for 10 years, see you can't sell this property to anyone but the city and we've established a price at which that would be sold to the city after those 10 years if the university does choose to sell which i think is an unlikely scenario we have a right of first offer and that right of first offer is meaningful because it gives us plenty of time to respond to notice from the university that they're intending to sell some or all of the land. And so we have time to ask our council and then our community if they're willing to go down this pathway. Um, and then also it's worth noting that CU, if this annexation goes through and they develop, will pay the full connection fees for the utility service that will be provided there. And so that was another point that it wasn't clear how that was gonna land and it's landed in a way that I think is good for both parties. Um, fundamentally, we have to act now. The peace, health and property of at least 2,300 people plus any visitors or growth in the South Boulder Creek <coughs> um, watershed depend on us getting our flood protection in place. And I don't know how we can possibly do that without this annexation. Um, we need to protect not only lives and property, but it keeps open the primary evacuation route of US 36 and emergency responders can get into the city um, for longer than they would without the flood project. I believe it's worth noting that Highway 93 would be long closed by the time US 36 would overtop if there's a hundred year flood project in place. And so when 93 closes, that means US 36 is the main entrance and exit to town for many of the people. Um, we've declared a climate emergency. This is a clear example, the flood project of adaptation to climate change. And so all cities are gonna be required to take these kind of steps. And it means that we can't wait to do it. Delay equals higher risk. Um, I believe that if we passed this by emergency, not only is it clearly an emergency measure because of the peace, health, and property protection, but it also allows city staff to proceed with expenditures with all due speed and at whatever level is needed to complete the design and the permitting uh, application process. And a lot of that is because if we pass by emergency, a signed annexation agreement can come relatively quickly afterwards, which gives us better standing um, to make our, our applications for permits. Um, minimizing delays seems to me to be critical as we proceed with the flood project. So this annexation is important to that and passing it by emergency has the best chance of not only doing all of the life safety protection, but also minimizing delays. And I think it's also important to note as we have before, that if we pass this on emergency, which I'm going to support, it doesn't disenfranchise our voters in any way. It doesn't change the process they go through, doesn't change the timeline, and it doesn't change the potential outcomes that are available for any citizen referendum or the currently pending citizen initiative. So I'll just close up by saying, I think that this is a very good deal. I think it is very fair. I think it enables critical flood protection to occur in a timely 
fashion. It's a climate response, which we must take. It's protective of habitat and it addresses pressing housing needs. It is not a perfect outcome for all parties, but it is quite good. And I'm gonna support passing resolution 1295, as well as passing ordinance 8483 as an emergency measure. And I thank you for bearing with me. And I will now turn to any other council members who'd like to hold forth on your views. Mark. Terrific. This is the only time during this council that I'm going to be briefer than you, Sam. I'm pleased. For me, you know, everything starts with the question of whether you believe it's important and necessary to provide flood mitigation for the neighborhoods affected by the 2013 flood. If you don't, it is entirely reasonable to, to oppose this annexation. But if you do, then there's no alternative, there's no option other than to engage with the landowner to try to reach a compromise and a mutually beneficial agreement. I think we've done that. And through many drafts of the annexation agreement, we've created a document that provides many benefits to the city, limits the scope of what CU can build on its portion of the property, and provides us with the possibility of achieving flood mitigation. Sam went into great detail on the benefits of the agreement, of the agreement and I don't wanna rehash them here, uh, but they're very extensive and they advance the interests of this city. Is it a perfect agreement? That would be an absurd expectation. It's a negotiated commercial contract between two parties. In any such situation, the only way one gets everything one wants is if one of the contracting parties is drunk and doesn't have a lawyer. But it's an agreement that substantially advances key interests of the city. And I think our negotiating team has done an excellent job. I do want to address some of the, the comments that have been made that um, we have negotiated this deal in secret behind closed doors. There is not one word of this agreement that has not been presented to the full council for comments and revisions, and not one word that has not been made fully public for additional comments and suggestions. But in a commercial negotiation, the parties need to speak to each other candidly, sometimes even more than candidly. And that cannot productively be done on a TV screen. It is not undemocratic so long as the entire legislative body renders its final judgment and the people have a voice, which they will have with ballot measure 302. Again, with an anticipated re referendum to reverse our actions tonight, with the potential for yet another referendum on the OSBT um, disposal, and at least in my case, with a vote for a new council in November. As I said in my earlier hotline post, this was a relatively close decision for me. I do understand the positives and negatives and I very much respect those who've come to a different conclusion. But support for this annexation agreement is where I thought the evidence led me and I will vote for it tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Next I have Mary, Rachel and Aaron. Mary. Thanks, Sam. So earlier, this evening, I mentioned that I went through the RJH report yesterday, and I'm going to read a, um, a, a, a phrase, a sentence that I found within that report that really kind of hit home to me and why um, one of the questions I kept asking myself as I read the final version of the annexation agreement was, um, you know, Sam talked about that it's fair. The question I ask myself, is it just? And um, as, as I was reading through this document yesterday, I came across this sentence. Um, flood studies prior to 1996 did not identify a flood threat in the West Valley from South Boulder Creek. And the West Valley was subsequently developed without consideration for a large flood event. And what that says to me is that that area was likely should never have been developed. And yet um, it was developed because um, of a mapping error, which has subsequently been corrected. But to me, the flood mitigation is the just piece of it. Um, 
we inadvertently put people in harm's way. And it's not just harm's way, but it is, they are in a high hazard zone. We saw in the testimony last week, um, and, and we, we've seen it at previous um, um, hearings where people came and showed us videos of what was going on in the streets. Um, the, the photograph that we saw last week, people's testimony where they were um, clearly traumatized, um, near tears. Um, they're in a high hazard zone, um, which is the worst place that you can be during a flood. Um, and I live adjacent to a high hazard zone. Um, we watched it in 2013 and thankfully um, we had little negligible damage, but I walked those streets in 2013 out in the, the worst hit areas. And um, it, was, it was devastating. The amount of debris was mountains worth. Um, so, you know, to the, to, the, to the point of passing it by emergency, it's clearly to me, it's an emergency. Um, people who testified last week were clearly traumatized and passing it by emergency would provide some assurance that we will be moving forward to apply for the permits and to move forward to establish the boundaries for what that flood mitigation looks like because that's what the sanitation agreement does. And it will provide some measure of comfort that things are clearly moving forward. So to me, that is um, the mental health part of it. And, um, and clearly a reason to pass it by emergency. So it's, it's, it's really um, clear to me. Um, 2,300 people in harm's way, some of whom, many of whom probably, aren't even aware that they are in harm's way. So, um, so, so that's the part that I answered just yesterday in a very clear manner for me, is that this annexation agreement is just is only for that reason. So um, all of the other stuff that Sam mentioned to me, I was continually um, struck as we went through the process of negotiating how um, collaborative it was. I know how much the community says that um, CU is taking advantage of the city and that um, they're not playing with us and I disagree. They clearly lived up to the second guiding principle. The first guiding principle in the CU guiding principles is flood mitigation is at the core. And the second guiding principle is collaboration. And I think that all parties have lived up to that expectation. So it's been a collaborative process. Um, and one more thing I would just want to add to what the many comments that, um, that Sam made and, and what Mark has said is that in, in the, the two council members that participated in the negotiation, everything that Mark said is true. Everything was, was um, run by the full council and the community. And the important reason to have had Rachel and Sam at the table is that staff can only take it so far. Um, there are some negotiations that are political and staff cannot do that. And having them at the table enabled us to achieve this collaborative agreement. Um, without their participation, it is quite likely that we would not have gotten here. So that's another reason that, um, that I think that, that their participation was so important and, um, and to be um, well accused of secret meetings um, is, you know, I think an assault on all of our integrity. So um, I just have to say that. Um, uh, I think that's, that's all I have right now. Um, but anyway, um, I'll be voting for um, supporting both the resolution and the ordinance, um, resolution 1295-8783 ordinance 
on an emergency basis. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mary. Rachel. Thank you for that, um, Mary, and for um, also noting the mental health aspects of, of this emergency. Um, so I agree with basically everything that Sam and Mark and Mary said. And Sam, I thank you for laying out um, a lot of the, the background and, and the issues so concretely for the rest of us to, to follow up on. Um, so I will try not to, to repeat points or, or extend the discussion unnecessarily. I do wanna take a moment and just thank Sam and Mary in particular. I think you both have worked on this process for about a decade maybe. And so I, I just, I think the community owes you a debt of gratitude and I thank you. Um, I will be voting yes tonight. Um, and I'll primarily be doing that for flood mitigation and to protect lives. Um, I would just add to, to what's been said that in terms of equity and who is protected, um, almost one third, full one third of the individuals in harm's way who will be protected um, from what has been described tonight as violent and deadly flash flooding. And that is what is at the heart of this discussion. About a third of these individuals live in affordable housing. And that includes a high percentage of all the individuals citywide who have been unhoused and we have helped out of homelessness and into housing. They are in um, the direct path of these floods and they are some of the people that we will be getting out of harm's way. Um, those in harm's way also include a high number of um, older folks in our community. I have personally gotten to know a lot of Fraser Meadows residents through my work on this project. Um, and a lot of people who survived the 2013 um, floods and fought for flood protections um, and fought hard so that no one else would suffer for what they went through um, have passed away in the last eight years. And I just want to acknowledge that they spent their last years advocating for what we are voting on tonight. And I thank them. Um, I will, I will, uh, I'm gonna cut it short now um, and just say that I will also be voting for emergency because um, I sincerely believe that we need the flood protection. Um, and the charter says that we can vote for emergency if um, something is urgent around preserving public peace, health, and property. Um, and we are already eight years out from the last flood and we know that this is urgent and the next one is coming. Um, and so because it is urgent on these fronts, I will be voting for emergency and I will be voting yes, thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Aaron. And so, well, I, I will also agree with um, everything that's been said. So I appreciate my colleagues for being so articulate and laying out all the issues, uh, Sam in particular for covering all the, all the bases about why we're here and the history that led up to it and why we're approaching this. And, and it is fundamentally, it's to protect the life safety of our residents, right? As, as my colleagues have, have been speaking uh, about movingly and um, including those, uh, those folks uh, in affordable housing, you know, some of them live in garden level apartments uh, directly in uh, the floodplain in the high hazard zone. So the flash flooding um, is entering, you know, people live in, in one level, uh, partly underground, and the, the floodwaters just go right in um, to their windows and their doors. And it, we didn't see these pictures last week in the testimony, but if you've seen some of the photos of some of those apartments uh, that were damaged so extensively, uh, it was one of the, the number of areas where we're very fortunate that we didn't lose any lives in the 2013 flood. Um, but the, the necessity of protecting these folks uh, from the next uh, flooding event is just is just critical. And it's why we're doing this project. And I think the, we asked many, many questions of staff uh, to address concerns in the community about why we're doing it this way and not another way in a lot of different areas. And I think we have good answers for all of that. Uh, we've spent um, over a decade uh, very carefully working through all the alternatives. And we have arrived at this through very careful consideration, none of it being rushed, um, many years of working collaboratively with uh, the county and CU and uh, years of negotiation, two years uh, at this point. Um, so we, we've worked really hard and I feel very good about uh, where we are right now. Um, as Mark said, it's not perfect, no agreement ever is, but uh, the flood protection that we're getting for our community coupled with the uh, desperately needed housing and, um, and the open space protections uh, are, are significant benefits to our, our community. Um, also, the, I think the transportation caps that we have in there, it's an innovative approach. Uh, CU always has a very high alt mode share when people go in between their different campuses. So 
there's a lot to like here and the uh, potentially problematic aspects have all been mitigated by clauses in the agreement. So I think we're on the, the right track here, absolutely. I do want to really thank um, Sam and Rachel uh, from Council for the many, many, many hours of meetings uh, that you put into to get this agreement to where it is right now. Uh, it's extremely tough. Thank you so much. And also for the staff team, uh, there are a number of folks from city staff that were in all those meetings as well. Um, and so appreciate all the hard work that you put into that and then the collaboration from, from CU on their side as well. And um, just the last couple points. Um, one is that um, we, we are not, there, there's a lot of talk in emails that we're getting to say that we're subverting a democratic process by passing this now. But as, uh, as Sam and others have stated, uh, the right of referendum still exists. And if, um, if citizens want to collect signatures on this and put it to a vote, that absolutely is still allowable. Um, so you know, the democratic process is allowed to continue on un, unabated. And then I will be supporting this uh, on an emergency basis. You know, in our charter section 17, um, it says that an emergency is, uh, must be for the preservation of public peace, health or property. And uh, the public peace uh, is a real issue from the, the mental health challenges faced by those in harm's way, uh, the worries they have every time that it rains hard. Um, so we're assisting with that. Uh, people's health and lives are at risk and of course the property of all um, the buildings um, in the floodway. So I think there's uh, every case for doing passing this by emergency and I'll be supporting this tonight, um, a yes vote on that basis. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> so with that, I'll turn to there, Adam, I see your hand and then Mirabai, I'll be asking if you wanna speak after Adam. Adam, go for it. Yeah, thanks Tim. Um, this has been Definitely a struggle to come to a finite conclusion, um, but you know it's our duty as council to vote yes or no in these decisions, even when you don't agree with everything that you know comes along with the proposal. So, um, real quick, uh, could the members of CU turn your camera on as well? I'm, I'm going to be ad addressing you uh, for some of this, and I always like seeing who I'm talking to. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, everything that Sam laid out, there are a lot of benefits to this agreement. And I really do appreciate all the hard work that went into that. And, you know, there's a lot of negotiation. There were countless hours um, dedicated to this moment. Um, and I just want to say that I've learned a lot along the way about, you know, our city, about CU but really about institutions. And when two institutions have to go up against each other in a contract negotiation, it's, it's a very, very unique um, circumstance um, because you know I don't think there's any council that would have agreed to annexing this property if flood mitigation weren't necessary. And I don't think CU would ever give up any land if they didn't need the property annexed. So we came to the only possible outcome here um, through negotiation for both sides to get what they wanted out of this. Um, and, you know, that's, that's extremely tough, especially when you're a council member who's here for a couple years against an institution that has plans out well past when all, we'll all be dead in this room. So um, that was a very unique spot. And I think, you know, that's a tough spot to be in. So um, I just want you all to know that um, while we're making this decision. Um, that being said, uh, I've, I've come up, you know, on both sides of this argument, the things that I would implore CU to do in the future, since it's clear that at this point there's gonna be um, passage of the annexation, that you do look into um, a, a possible land swap uh, with the other property. Uh, if that is indeed something you know, that, that 
you would be agreeable to in the future. I think it's worth future councils to look at. And the reason why I think that is because I just fundamentally disagree with building next to a property that is gonna be used for flood mitigation. Because when you cover land with cement buildings, anything that is not dirt and allows for you know, additional rainwater to fill in there, you're essentially shoving that water into the flood mitigation. So um, I just think if the city and CU could come to an agreement where uh, future property that's gonna be developed was not even near a high hazard flood zone, that would be so beneficial for the entire community. Um, that's, that's the main point I really wanted to get out there and I appreciate you listening to that CU. Um, I'm also going to uh, vote yes to Annex. And much like Mark, this was a close decision because my idealism for what would be um, beneficial to the community has gone, you know, butted up against the reality of what we need in flood mitigation. And, uh, you know, uh, that, that the health and safety components just went out in that scenario. So um, that's where I landed. And it certainly was one of the hardest decisions in these two years. Um, so thank you to all the other council members who, you know, uh, put in all the work and listened uh, along the way and the thousands and thousands of people who engaged on this, you know, we, we did receive thousands of emails that I think we all read and I, I'm sure we'll continue, continue to receive hundreds more after this um, and know that as a community, we did see those, we did hear you and it looks like this is just the best case scenario that we can come up with right now. And what I think is more and more a post best case scenario world that we're living in. So thanks. Thank you, Adam. And um, Mirabai, would you like to say anything before we move on to potential motions? Um, I, yeah, I guess I, I don't have much to say other than um, I do appreciate all the time and effort that's gone into this. I think it's quite impressive and it is appreciated. Um, I do appreciate all the community's feedback, the countless hours that everyone has spent on this from the community to staff to council members um, that does not go unseen and well, probably does go unseen by many, but uh, for those of us who do know what this entails, we, we do appreciate it. Um, I will not be supporting this tonight uh, for my own reasons and it's um, a lot of value based. Um, understand life is, Important property is important. Uh, I know that more than most being a volunteer firefighter for 10 years, um, but this does not hit my ideals or my values um, to the point where I can support this. So uh, again, I do, that does not um, decrease my appreciation for uh, all of the time and community engagement and staff and council um, that have put into this stuff. So. Thank you, Mirabai. <clears throat> All right, well, I, I have one colloquy, which is to Adam's point. Um, and, and I would also say that um, I think it's worth looking at a land swap should, should we get the urban services study done and all the conditions um, that would make it acceptable to see you to look at. So I would encourage the university to keep an open mind about that um, as we move forward. We do have to go through the process of um, annexing that property in before that could even be a possibility. So I hope that um, staff will, uh, and the next council, I guess this is really uh, to the next council. I hope the next council will um, have a look at kicking off the urban services study because there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, and this is one of them. So with that, I will stop my colloquy and turn to you, Aaron. So Sam, I'll make a motion if that's all right. Please. So I think there are two things in front of us. So I'm gonna start with one motion on the resolution. So um, I move that we adopt resolution 1295, setting forth findings of fact and conclusions regarding the annexation of approximately 308.15 acres of land 
generally known as CU South and located at 4886 and 5278 Table Mesa Drive, zero Highway 36, two parcels, 718 Marshall Road and 4745 West Moorhead. Rachel? A second. All right, we have a motion and a second. And Alicia, if it's okay, I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote. Of course, sir. Of course, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, yep. Okay. All right, we will start with Mayor Weaver. Aye. Councilmember Young? Yes. Rocket? Aye. Friend? Yes. Nagel? No. Swetnick? Yes. And Wallach? Aye. Sir, resolution 1295 has been approved with a vote of six to one. Very good, thank you for that. Aaron, would you like to make a second motion? I would. Uh, so I will move that we adopt by emergency measure ordinance 8483, annexing to the city of Boulder approximately 308.15 acres of land, generally known as CU South, located at 4886 and 5278 Table Mesa Drive, zero highway 36, two parcels, 718 Marshall Road and 4745 West Moorhead, with an initial zoning classification of public as described in chapter 95 modular zone system BRC 1981, amending the zoning district map forming a part of said chapter to include the property in the above mentioned zoning district and approving the annexation agreement with the inclusion of the amendments sent out on hotline on September 20th, 2021, captured on record and mutually agreed upon by both Boulder City Council and the University of Colorado and setting forth related details. Rachel. A second, and I um, just have a question. Did we need to um, give CU any opportunity to clarify or anything before we had this vote? I, I do not believe so. I plan to turn to them at the end, but I'll turn to Sandra. Sandra, is there any requirement that we have CU speak here? No. Okay, Thank very you for good. the question though. So we have a motion and a second. Alicia, would you take us through a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Council Member Young. Yes. Rocket. Aye. Friend. Yes. Nagel. No. Swetlick. Yes. Wallach. Aye. And Weaver. Aye. All right, sir. Ordinance 84, 83 is hereby adopted by emergency by vote of six to one. Thank you very much, Alicia. I'm going to turn now to you, Sandra, and see uh, could you let us know if we have done everything that we need to do to adopt the annexation of CU South? Uh, yes, I believe so. I, uh, there isn't anything else that needs to be done. And uh, thank you for a really clean process tonight. Appreciate everyone's efforts. Great. Thank you, Sandra. And I will bring this back <clears throat> to us. Um, and, and I think those of us who'd like to speak should um, speak to this. I would like to start by turning to the university, the applicant in this case, and hear any final thoughts from the university now that we have adopted the annexation of CU South. Yes, Mayor Weaver, um, Phil Stefano, Chancellor at the university. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students here at the University of Colorado, I wanna thank city council for this collaboration on this very important issue and also to discuss that, you know, we, we want to continue this partnership with you uh, throughout um, this, this year and in the future. It's been a wonderful collaboration between the city and the university, and it's a partnership that I do want to continue. So thank you all. Very good. Thank you. 
uh, Chancellor DiStefano, thank you to the CU team. I'm gonna step in here and thank a lot of people. So I wanna start by thanking um, all of council for all of the work that you have done over the years, especially Mary. Mary has been working on this for longer than any of us has. She probably saw more on planning board than I even saw. And so thank you, Mary, for uh, the input and work you've done on this. Thank you to all of council. I want to turn to staff and I want to call out Phil Kleisler uh, in particular for thanks because um, tomorrow will be Phil's last day with the city. But I can say that without Phil's work, his diligence, his calm head, unruffled demeanor, um, we would never have been able to get through this. Um, Phil kept everyone moving in the right direction. He always had helpful suggestions when issues came up. Um, and he kept all the cats herded when their cats were all trying to run in different directions. So um, Phil, thank you for the work you did leading this. Thank you, Mayor. It was a pleasure. And Joe Tadeucci, um, uh, Utilities Director, um, without you, we would never have been able to work through all the details of the flood project and your predecessors who have done the work, all the people who work for you who haven't testified before us. I know how much work you have done, so thank you. Also to Dan Burke and John Potter, especially uh, in the open space staff who have helped um, get the uh, appropriate concerns communicated from the uh, Open Space Board of Trustees to us so that we could negotiate them into the agreement and staff could continue to work on them. Uh, your contributions were also invaluable and they're much appreciated. Um, it, it's hard to name all of the folks who should be thanked um, because this project has touched many, many people, including our new city manager, our uh, interim city attorney, Aaron Poe, thank you very much. Aaron was the um, city attorney who stepped in after David Gear and has helped us do all the last hard work at getting the, the legal niceties tidied up. Because when Aaron, I believe when you came on, we didn't really have much of a working version of a legal agreement. It was just a term sheet. So thank you very much. Thank you. And to the university. Um, I. I I think we need to remember Frances Draper at this moment. She put in so much time um, with our community and from the university side at um, teeing this up and shaping it and forming it through the guiding principles and so on. And then to Derek and Abby, thank you very much for all the work that you put in um, and Pat <clears throat> and um, Chancellor DiStefano, thank you all for your very hard work. Also, Elvie, the attorney on the CU Boulder team. Um, thank you all for the time that you put in. And lastly, but most importantly, I want to thank the community. Um, this project, more than any other that I've been part of, has divided our community. Um, the history has contributed to a lot of bad feelings, which have persisted. The flood scared, frightened, and traumatized and threatened the lives of many people in 2013, highlighting the critical importance of being able to do this. There have been people in our community who have been enjoying the CU South property for walking their dogs, recreating, and being in nature. And I know that change will be coming to this property as a result of that. And that can't be easy for people who love that land. Um, so thank you to the community. Your input has shaped this agreement more than you can ever know. All of those questions that Mary asked at the beginning of this hearing came from the community and they were part of the dialogue that we have needed to go through in order to do a fair shaping of this process and a fair hearing. So thanks to all of you who have been part of this um, project. I think now we need to look forward now we need to look ahead at how we make this the best outcome possible for the entire community. And that means preserving the open space, that means removing the levee, that means restoring the land to that riparian habitat that it can be. Um, we need to come together with the university in addition to this project and all of the other 
projects we have, we need to shape each other. We need to talk about housing. We need to talk about growth. We need to talk about how to collaborate as the CU South site is developed. So to me, this is the beginning of an opportunity to bring the disparate parts of our community together with a common vision and a common goal of making this as good as it can possibly be. So all of you who have worked so hard on this deserve kudos. Those of you who are disappointed by this decision, I'm sorry for that, but know that we are listening to you regardless of what the decision has been. And with that, I would like to turn to council for any other final comments before we close. Rachel? I agree with everything that you just said. Um, and um, just want to thank you in particular as well. Um, you've been a, a, an exemplary leader through this project. And I think that a lot of people, even on council, probably cannot appreciate the I wouldn't even know how to estimate how much time you had to put into the negotiations and, and shepherding this process. And it's, um, it's, it's been a hard thing to step into because there's been a lot of criticism. So I just wanna thank you for leading all of us through this project and this process for the last 10 years and especially for the last year. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, council, any other council comments? Staff, Mary. happens at least once a meeting. Um, I want to thank, start by thanking the community. Um, and, you know, and echoing what Sam said regarding um, the folks that... Isha, could you mute? What? I'm sorry. There you oh, go. There Perfect. we go. Thank you. <laughs> Sounded like a train, uh, the inside of a train. Um, I just want to start by thanking the community. And um, and as Sam said, I know that there are many people out there that are disappointed, but your input shaped this agreement. And as Sam said, more than you'll know, um, I know that Sam and Rachel both try to incorporate as many of the items that were brought up by the community. I know I worked with um, OSBT to um, include the light and noise piece of it. That was a really important part and piece to a lot of people who, as Sam said, have enjoyed this land and have a huge attachment to this land. Um, the collaboration, as Sam said, is something that is at the very beginning, and I hope that this plants a seed going into the future. And as Adam said, long after most of us on this picture frame <laughs> style of meeting um, are gone, that it has set a way of being um, partners. So Thank you um, to the community. Thank you to um, Sam and Rachel and, um, and all of staff for all of your hard work. Um, and I hope that we continue on in a partnership um, that includes the community. So I see it as a three-way collaboration with the community, with staff, we see you actually four-way and council. So, um, that's really all I have to say. And um, let's move forward um, and try to heal from this process um, and put those divisions behind us and start putting one foot in front of the other. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. As you often say, onward. Adam. Yeah, I just wanted to give one more specific thank you to Phil um, since he was in the mix of everybody, but. I feel like all of council needs to be very thankful for his contribution and, um, you know, utmost professionalism along the way, always super helpful, um, answering any question we needed and, you know, did all the site tours with us, everything he possibly could to keep us the best informed as, um, we could be as just lay people, um, who are making these decisions. So 
um, can't thank you, Phil, enough for helping us. And best of luck uh, going forward. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate it. Okay, last call for comments. Nuria. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And I just wanted to say real quickly, and I know this has been a long evening, but as someone who just arrived to this community, I'll say it's been incredible to learn about the history of this project and the passion with which everyone came to it. And so I join the chorus of thank yous, both to all of you at council, staff, I just have no words for how amazingly diligent they have been, both staff now and staff that started this decades ago as they were moving forward. And then really truly, I just wanted to say thank you to community. Community, whether you were in, a, in agreement with this franchise or with this agreement or whether you were not, um, I think they pushed us to make this agreement better and richer. And I hope that, the, and I think I, I can speak, and I don't want to speak for you, CU, uh, CU, but I think I can say that we will all continue to listen. And on behalf of the city, I'll say that our commitment will be to continue to partner with CU, to continue to listen to all those voices, whether they were critical of this or whether they in favor in this. We are all, as Mary said, in this together. And we remain committed to continuing to listen to you all, to our community, and to partnering as this moves forward. So I just wanted to say a quick word of thanks to everyone in this process. Very good. Thank you, Nuria. And I'll say again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to council. And um, with that, I'm going to gavel this meeting closed at 925. Everyone have a good night. Thank you, everyone.